This channel is part of the History Hit Network. The Stuarts, a bloody reign, is an evocation of the extraordinary era when these four Stuart kings lived through turbulent times. Catholic versus Protestant. Parliament against King. The English Civil War. Europe torn apart by religious conflict. The plague, the Great Fire of London. And finally, a Catholic king fled his country and his throne. As we reveal their fates, we'll trace the story of another family, the Wynns who lived here at Gwydir. They were there for the great events of the era and their fortunes rose and fell with that of the Stuarts. James I inherited a throne through his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots. This would bring the two kingdoms together, but at such a bloody cost. I admire James I. I like his intellect and his inquiring mind. He was somebody who was very curious about life, a man who was trying to make sense of the world. I think it's very important with James that he felt himself committed to promoting unity of his peoples, the peoples of England, Ireland and Scotland, unity of Europe and the union of Christianity itself that might even reunite Protestants and Catholics. Charles I, the reluctant king, pushed into being the heir because his brother, the magnificently suitable Prince Henry, had died. Charles struggled to be the king that everyone longed for. Through history, we think Charles I lost his head, having lost the Civil War. But we forget the years when he was seen as the luckiest monarch in Europe. He was a highly sophisticated king. He really put British visual culture on the map both in terms of what he commissioned in the form of Rubens and Van Dyck, but also what he collected. Charles II, the restoration would bring unity and glamour back to the country. The people were worn out by the austerity of Cromwell and the parliamentarian era and ecstatically welcomed the new king. In the reign of Charles II, you have the birth of modern times. Clever people who were literally rebuilding England. And then the fire in London, which enabled London to be rebuilt. It must have been so exciting uh, by the time you got to about 1700 to look around and find yourself in this spanking new city. James II, the Catholic king of a Protestant country, was a disaster waiting to happen. I think history is very tough on James II. He was a very brave, headstrong figure, a very good soldier, very good admiral. But unfortunately, being so pig-headedly Roman Catholic, was the undoing of him. In the autumn of 1605, a letter arrived here at Gwydir Castle for the owner, Sir John Wynne. It contained an urgent message. It implored Sir John not to travel to London for the opening of Parliament that November. Wynne had been planning to do just that. King James I, all his ministers and the Lords would be attending. John Wynne didn't know it at the time, but he just received a tip-off about the most notorious attempted terror attack in British history, the Gunpowder Plot. A small group of religious fanatics wanted to blur Parliament, kill the King, and return Protestant England to the Catholic faith. The plot failed, but to this day, the 5th of November is celebrated across the country with bonfires and fireworks. But there was far more to King James I's rule than gunpowder 
treason and plot. James was the first of a new dynasty to rule England, the Stuarts, and he came to the throne at a dangerous time. Britain was divided as never before between nations, between religions, between rulers and the ruled. Rebellion was in the air. History hit is like Netflix, just for history fans. With exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. With familiar faces such as Dan Jones and Dr. Eleanor Yanega, we've got hundreds of documentaries covering the greatest figures and events of medieval history. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Chronicle fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code CHRONICLE at checkout. Queen Elizabeth I had died on the 24th of March, 1603. She had ruled England for over 44 years, but she left no heir, so she would be the last of the Tudor monarchs. Succeeding her would be King James VI of Scotland, the son of a woman Elizabeth had put to death, Mary, Queen of Scots. However, despite this difficult family history, James I's succession to the English throne had been agreed by both parties via secret correspondence in the years before Elizabeth's death. James had held the Scottish throne since he was just 13 months old, but now he would sit on the thrones of England and Ireland as well, in what was known as the Union of the Crowns. We are here at the Charter House in Smithfield, London. This magnificent complex began life as a home to Carthusian monks in the 14th century. But its days as a monastery were brought to a violent end during the reign of Henry VIII. It became one of the great aristocratic houses during the Tudor period. And when King James VI of Scotland, soon to be King James I of England, headed down from Edinburgh to London in 1603, he held his first ever court right here. James had been invited to do so by Thomas Howard. Howard would be rewarded with the title of Lord Chamberlain in the new King's government. Charter House is now a palace of the Howard family. Suffolk, resident there, is related to the man who had tried to depose Elizabeth in favour of James's mother, Mary, Queen of Scots. So the Howards are people he knows are loyal to him, and it seems to him that he's going to make him Lord Chamberlain, the head of his household, uh, the, the man in charge of the everyday management of the court, that he's a crucial figure and he should be given priority when it comes to uh, meetings in London and where he's seen to be. James had been greeted by huge crowds of enthusiastic supporters as he made his way down from Scotland. But things turned sour almost as soon as he reached London and held his first court here at the Charter House. The original monastery built on this site was constructed on land that had been used to bury the countless dead from the Great Plague of the 14th century. Of course, the threat of another outbreak always remained, and it just so happened that the dreaded disease returned with a vengeance almost as soon as James arrived. It hampered his plans for coronation, and for many of the citizens, it was a bad omen about his reign. Plague had been something they'd all lived with in these houses um, forever. I mean, they were well used to outbreaks of the plague, not just in London, but local outbreaks as well. Those that don't like James think it's a judgment from God. Those who do like James think it's an unfortunate recurrence of the plague. There's apprehension because he's a foreigner, because the English on the whole don't like the Scots, uh, and because they're worried about a Scottish takeover. And James um, has to balance that very carefully because if he, he, he doesn't want to become a purely English king, neglecting his original kingdom to the north, but neither does he want the Scots to take over. And he does initially, particularly, a very good balancing act. James knew he had to be especially careful of usurpers. His father, Lord Darnley, had been murdered and his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, had been executed. He'd faced attempts on his life while ruling in Scotland and this didn't change in England. 
Almost immediately, two plots were being made to remove him from power. The main plot, the by-plot. Sir Walter Raleigh, one of Queen Elizabeth's favourites, was even involved in the conspiracy. But it was the gunpowder plot of 1605 that would come the closest to eliminating King James I. <laughs> here at Gwydir are supporters of the new King James and are advancing in courtly life. John Wynne, head of the family, is about to return to Whitehall. Attending Parliament would be injurious to my health. Richard, what meaning do you impute to that? Come on, boy. He is your physician. Ah. The city heirs will be fettered, of course, and all manner of thieves and cutthroats will dog my journey, with plenty more to be found in Parliament besides. But ever before was it thus, and no letter then from my dear friend the doctor. Some new peril lies behind this innovation. One that strikes a Parliament, and even the King. Aye. Should we warn His Majesty? There's always a problem with plots, as with a gunpowder plot, that in order to succeed, you have to have enough people to carry through the aftermath of the assassination of the king. But the more people you tell, the more likely it is you'll tell the wrong people and they'll leak it. Uh, and that's what seems to have happened here. It is one of the great what-if moments in history. The 13 conspirators hired a cellar directly below the chamber in which James was due to appear. Under the supervision of their munitions expert, Guy Fawkes, they filled the cellar with dozens of barrels of gunpowder, more than enough to do the job. But too many people were being warned to stay away, and this aroused suspicions. One was the Catholic priest who warned his old friend, John Wynne. Another was the writer of an anonymous letter which eventually made its way to the king and his privy council. And it will be Thomas Howard, the owner of the Charter House, and now the new Lord Chamberlain, who would head down to the cellars of Parliament in order to investigate. The entire cellars were searched, and Guy Fawkes and his bowels of gunpowder were discovered. After days of terrible torture, Fawkes confessed. The other conspirators were killed or captured. The plot had failed. The demise of the would-be terrorists triggered national rejoicing. But the plot exposed the divisions in James's new kingdom. How would he handle these challenges? And how would the Wynne family thrive in this dangerous new world? The gunpowder plot of 1605 had been foiled at the last moment. Parliament had been saved from destruction, and King James I continued to rule over Scotland, Ireland and England. But this would be a challenging reign, to say the least. James had been raised a Protestant, and a Catholic conspiracy had been made against his life. To further worsen matters, not all of his new subjects were very pleased with the idea of a Scottish king, nor were the Scots thrilled by their monarch's departure for London. James sought to maintain peace amid these divisions. He did tighten anti-Catholic measures after the gunpowder plot, but Otherwise, he broadly tolerated religious difference, provided it didn't threaten his rule. And there was another slight issue to deal with, a lack of money. A constant shortage of funds had plagued his time ruling in Edinburgh, and James hoped that his new kingdom would solve all his financial woes. This wouldn't quite be the case, given how extravagant a court James liked to maintain. So new money-making ventures were needed, and this need would benefit the Wynne family of North Wales. Is this all of them? It is. I'm certain there were more. The letters patent have been issued. You do still have that list I sent you. Owen, father is made baronet. His majesty has bestowed upon us a great honor. An honor we must pay for, 300 pounds a year. And for three years? Can purchase many books. There exist some things more important than swelling your library, brother. I cannot conceive of them. The title will be the family's forever. It will be our dear brother John's and his sons and his sons after that. We younger brothers are better off investing in books. It is a sign of royal favor. It is a sign 
that the king has run out of money. Now, have you that list I sent you or nay? The winds of Gwydir are perhaps the very first to get the baronet, which is a new hereditary knighthood at the James Institutes. You see, that's a very good way both of giving people a higher honour than just being an ordinary knight, and, of course, it's a money raiser because you pay for the privilege of being made a baronet. Sir John Wynne was one of the first baronets, and the reason was that he was perceived to be the senior knight of Wales, really. There were two of Wales, uh, one from the south, Sir Edward Stradling, and one from the north, Sir John Wynne. And I think it was self-evident when they put the lists together that his extraordinary dominance in all public affairs in North Wales uh, meant that he was going to be on the list. He's very much of the period in that he's canny, acquisitive, he's very intelligent and very well educated, um, but he's carving out an empire for himself um, at a time when other people are doing similar. So there are a lot of heads being trodden on to get where he is, and that means there's a lot of jealousy, a lot of envy from his contemporaries, particularly his neighbours. This was a win-win situation for the Wins and the Stuarts. John gained greater power and status, and King James got money for the treasury by giving away titles to his most loyal subjects at an excellent price. King James needed to raise funds directly from the wealthier families in the country because he was often in conflict with Parliament, both in Scotland and England. He had been set on unifying his two nations. The kingdoms were on the same island after all, and now they had the same ruler. James believed that God had made it so for a reason. The English and Scottish parliaments were fiercely opposed to the idea of Great Britain. However, the debates, they're about prejudice. Scots feared they'd be ignored by the English, while the English feared the Scots would undercut wages and steal jobs. Mutual animosity ensured the scheme never proceeded. On the margins, there are people who really can't take James, they can't take a Scotsman, they can't take a Protestant. So there are a group of plotters who engage themselves with the idea of getting rid of him and replacing him by his cousin Arabella Stuart, who is also descended from Henry VIII's elder sister. There was also the problem of competing visions. James believed in the divine right of kings. He illustrated his views in two of his published works, The True Law of Free Monarchy and Basilican Doran, which is Greek for royal gift. James believed he was chosen by God to rule, therefore the law was an extension of his power and Parliament was subordinate. Many in Parliament viewed the relationship differently. They believed a king ruled through partnership and cooperation with lawmakers. This fundamental disagreement doomed the relationship and for much of his reign, James attempted to rule without Parliament. Hence the need for extra sources of money. I think one of the tragedies for the Stuarts, we look back on the executions, the exiles, and the general disastrous relationship with Parliament through a lot of the century or so that they were in control in this country. And one thing that is absolutely true is that they never had enough money. And uh, Parliament wasn't prepared to give enough or to tax enough in their own way. James brings in surcharges on customs which are called impositions, which don't have parliamentary authority and therefore are controversial with some. And the result of that is that the kings can manage on their own income in peacetime. The problem is, what will they do if they get into wars? Then you do need parliamentary supply. You can't possibly fund wars otherwise. And that's where the problems are going to arise. James was struck by the greatest tragedy that could befall a man who believed in the divine right of kings, the death of his firstborn son and heir. James has two children who survive infancy, a Henry, who had all the hallmarks of being a great all-rounder, great sportsman, great promoter of the arts, but also someone who is clearly quite radical in his Protestantism and is strongly supportive of the Protestant cause internationally. 
Henry dies in a rather unwise exercise of athleticism by swimming in the Thames and getting typhoid from the water. Whereas his younger brother, Charles, who'd had rickets as a, as a child, was bandy-legged, small, had a stutter, uh, wasn't intellectually the match of his older brother. He lives on and is to be the heir. And I always suspect that when James and perhaps Anne looked at Charles, they always looked with regret. Why are you the survivor? Why has our golden boy died? The country was devastated to learn about his sudden death and a period of mourning ensued. His younger brother, Charles, who'd adored his elder brother and tried to emulate him, would now be the successor to James. Back at Gwydir Castle, Sir John Wynne would suffer a similar tragic loss. Not long after the death of the heir to the throne, Prince Henry, devastating news arrives from Luca in Italy about the passing of the Wynne's eldest son, John. Dispatched from Tuscany by his companions. They had that decency at least. Dated this 23rd of August, 1614. Bequests to the parish first, of course, as is proper. The family. To my brother Owen, 10 pounds for the purchase of books. With temperance to your usual habits, that should see you through a week, perhaps. Thank you, Father. Thank your good brother. To Richard, my velvet coat. Father, I need not. Take it. Put it on. It's interesting that, of course, James I loses his eldest son, uh, Prince Henry, um, and Sir John Wynne loses his eldest son, uh, Sir John Jr. So th th they're both in the same sort of position in that sense, where uh, the second sons have to take over. So it's interesting that Sir Richard takes over that courtly role and ends up serving Charles, who is himself the number two. The Wynne family and the Stuarts grew ever closer as Richard Wynne was appointed groom of the bedchamber to Charles, the new heir to the throne, and would join him on a wild and highly secretive voyage to Spain. But for now, both families were in deep mourning. Richard, I must make ready. I am required at court. Stay a day or two, for mother's sake. I serve the young prince. I hear he is a fine marksman now. Tolerably so. And a better rider than most. He stammers yet and speaks too soft. But his efforts, I am certain, gladden his father. Stay safe in London, brother. It becomes you well. At this point, King James seemed beset on all sides and he increasingly relied only upon his closest advisers. But this also led to huge resentments over the years with the chief among them, his infamous and controversial favourites. There's long been speculation over James's sexuality because although the king was married to Anne of Denmark, he had seven children by her. He was always drawn to handsome men, often with near disastrous consequences. The favourite of his childhood years in Scotland, the Duke of Lennox, had been forced out by jealous lords. Robert Carr, another who was close to James during the early years of his reign in England, until a court scandal engulfed him, a handsome, foolish youth, ended his career. James then transferred his affections to another young courtier, a man named George Villiers. He would use the king's favour to sideline rival factions, enrich his family and become the most powerful nobleman in the country. The Wynne family weren't the only ones climbing up the social ladder during James's reign. Villiers was obviously fantastically physically attractive. This is written about by ambassadors of the time. They were absolutely struck dumb by his physical beauty. And it was something that he was very aware of. And of course, you know, James I uh, fell in love with him. He was born into a decent but not massive gentry family, and then he puts him up to every stage. 
Baron, Viscount, Earl, Marquis, Duke. I mean, there hasn't been a non-royal Duke for a couple of hundred years. There's always the jealousy of the overmighty courtier, but in this one man, Buckingham, his rise through the aristocracy, the way that the favour from the royal crown cascaded through his wider family, it must have been incredibly difficult for the older aristocracy to look at this man, arrive from almost nothing, and become, by some distance, the most powerful man in the kingdom. George Villiers would be raised to the title of Duke of Buckingham. He would be at the king's side for the rest of his reign, and he would play a crucial part in the events that would push England into war. We're here at the Queen's House in Greenwich, a magnificent building designed by the greatest architect of his era, Inigo Jones. It began construction in 1616 under the orders of King James I and was intended as a gift for his wife, Anne of Denmark, whom he'd married in 1589. But Anne would never see her finished Queen's House. She fell ill soon after construction began and died in 1619. Anne's a mysterious figure, emblematic of the challenging religious era in which she reigned. She had been raised a Lutheran in Denmark, but it's possible that she may have secretly converted to Catholicism at some point in her life. She infamously refused an Anglican communion at her coronation in England. If Anne did convert, well, even a queen had to keep it a very tightly guarded secret. The lure of the old faith seems to have been present for the Wynne family at Guido Castle as well but being a Catholic was a very dangerous endeavor. Father. Will you not sit, Father? I am not yet so infirm, eager though you may be for your inheritance, some wine. Of course. The prince still pins hope on the Spanish match. He has a portrait of the Infanta he much admires. Enough of the prince's fancy, what of the king? He too remains set. I wrote of this in my letter. You lack your brother's memorable expression. And the dowry? 600,000. Utterly dulky. The pleasing and the useful. Ah, the money spent on your schooling were not all wasted then. We know very little about their personal beliefs religiously because this is such a dangerous time. You're not gonna wear that. I think it's, we have to read between the lines, I think it's pretty clear that um, his wife, Lady Sidney Wynne, um, she certainly came from an old, uh, old faith family, the Gerrards of Lancashire. Uh, I think it's pretty clear, reading between the lines, that she remained Catholic, but it was a secret, she was a crypto-Catholic. She is to be allowed mass for herself and for her household, the Infanta. Should the contract be made? She will not be queen. A papist alone, England could suffer, but not a Spaniard, do. Many in court favour the match. Until the tide shifts. And then marvel at how forgetful of his past a man can be. <laughs> yes, Father. Do not turn papist, Richard. That was your dear late brother's mistake. You keep that faction at a clear remove. Do you understand me? I think one of the extraordinary things about the House of Stuart is that the whole tragedy of Catholic versus Protestant is contained within this royal house. It was never resolved, the question of whether England should become a Catholic or a Protestant country. You'd think, if you were a modern person, particularly if you weren't religious, but you just liked the idea of the Church of England and its inclusiveness and its beautiful music and its ceremonies, that this would have been the perfect compromise between the Protestant religion and the Catholic faith. In fact, it was even more divisive. And out of that arose the terrible, bloody English civil wars. You can become a known Catholic, you can become a recusant, and it'll kill your estate. The fines are so horrendously large that you can bleed out the estate, and that'll be the end of that. So if on principle you want to do that, fine, a lot of people did it. But most people actually just towed the line. 
and they, they went to church and, and they did their obeisance and um, privately they might, might have thought otherwise. I think there was a lot of what one might flippantly call sort of cafetiere Catholicism going on, particularly with people like Sir John Wynne. King James I was well aware of the delicate religious situation in the country. Many of his subjects in England and Scotland would be furious at any return to the Catholic religion in the royal family. But still, despite this, James attempted a union with Catholic Spain. By 1619, the king had lost his wife and his firstborn son and heir, and he would not get any respite in foreign affairs. War had broken out on the continent. The Thirty Years' War started in 1618. What began as a quarrel among the divided states of the Holy Roman Empire drew in all the major powers of the day. And with eight million casualties, it became the bloodiest religious conflict in European history. It was also the greatest foreign policy failure of King James I's reign. I think for the British living across the sea from the Thirty Years' War, it must have been a very frightening spectator sport, especially with the propaganda coming back from both sides. It resonated very much over here that this sort of absolute catastrophe could happen here through religious bigotry. I think it was uh, something that the English looked at askance and thought, we just cannot have that here. James was a peacemaker. He had ended the long Anglo-Spanish War soon after inheriting the throne, and he had grand hopes of securing a lasting peace in Europe. To do this, he began negotiations to marry his heir, Charles, to the Catholic Infanta of Spain, Maria Anna. The protracted talks were unpopular with the English Protestants. James, however, was more tolerant of religious differences than many. And he persisted. He believed binding England and Catholic Spain together would help secure peace in Europe. The Thirty Years' War confounded all those hopes. It was a conflict the king could not ignore because he had a personal stake in it. His daughter, Elizabeth, she was married to the Protestant Frederick V of the Electoral Palatinate, a pivotal figure in the early years of the war. England is requiring that the Spanish drive their cousins, the Austrians, out of the lands of James's daughter and her husband in, in the Palatinate, and that you're just asking too much. Rome is asking too much, and that Rome is expecting the children of the marriage to be brought up as Catholics, and James and Charles can't deliver that. So both sides were willing to make a deal, but only on their own terms, and the gap between them was simply too great. After the catastrophic defeat of Elizabeth and Frederick's forces at the Battle of White Mountain outside Prague in November 1620, James had to intervene. But war was expensive, and money had long been a problem for the English crown. James recalled Parliament, but the meeting was fractious and the MPs were more interested in investigating abuses by James's government than giving him the cash he wanted. James soon dissolved the meeting, as he had done so often before. He now had no choice but to rely on his diplomatic efforts. The Spanish match for his son was the only chance he saw of diffusing the conflict and helping his daughter. Negotiation with Madrid began again, but at the same slow pace as before. Frustrated by these constant delays, James's favourite, the Duke of Buckingham, and his son, Prince Charles, made an extraordinary decision. It is my ill fortune to be one of those who is shortly to follow the prince into Spain. Past doubt, the journey will be dangerous and expensive, but as subject and servant, I must needs obey. Prince Charles and the Duke of Buckingham were heading to Spain incognito, and Sir John Wynne's son and heir, Richard, was going with them. In February 1623, this group left England in disguise for a potentially perilous journey across Europe. The goal was to break the deadlock in the marriage negotiations with Charles winning the hand of the Spanish Infanta in person. It was romantic, foolishly daring, and it was doomed. In the spring of 1623, 
Richard Wynne, the heir to the Wynne estate, was travelling to Spain, along with Prince Charles, the heir to the throne, and the Duke of Buckingham. Richard wrote back home to Gwydir that he did not care for Spain at all. Richard's letter is full of fascinating insights, but there's one I really wanted to read to you. The group encounters a Spanish Jesuit priest who is preaching to the crowd. The priest's description of England vividly illustrates the religious challenges of the era. Henry VIII, King of England, until whose time the subjects there were obedient children to their mother church of Rome, having many famous martyrs that suffered for the cause, as Sir Thomas Becket and Sir Thomas More and diverse others. This king, I say, was the first who to satisfy his own lust and to bring his adulterous conception to his own heart's desire did, forgetting God and religion, alter the course of the ever-held obedience to the Church of Rome by dissolving their abbeys and putting to death I know not how many hundreds, for which act his soul lies chained in the bottomless pit of hell, in everlasting torments. This is not all their heretical opinions, but the damnablest and worst of all is, which is my last point, this is my body. They dare have the impudence to deny our Saviour's own words, saying it is but a sign and not the body and blood itself. Prince Charles wasn't likely to have much success on this Spanish sojourn. The Spanish trip was an extraordinary fiasco, really, and, and marvellously amateurish and, and silly. It was like a sort of adolescent jape in some ways. To think that this would be anything other than a diplomatic disaster, which of course it was, uh, was, was pretty naive. But off they went, um, Prince Charles and Duke of Buckingham, and, and of course, Sir Richard Wynne. Sir Richard had a, a very low opinion of Spain. He said there's no land worth speaking of, and the worst counties of North Wales are better than what he saw in Castile and Aragon. I mean, he's quite dismissive of it, but they have all sorts of adventures. And of course, the one thing they don't come back with is, is any sensible deal on the Infanta's hand. They managed to sort of wreck the plans of this great dynastic union between England and Spain. But it's very interesting that Sir Richard is a witness to that, and, and not only a witness, but he produces this account of the royal trip to Spain. And very amusing it is. The Spanish Infanta didn't really take to Charles, the future king. He wasn't a Catholic. He was an infidel who turned his back on the Church of Rome. This wasn't going to be as straightforward as his father James is married to the Lutheran princess, Anne of Denmark. When the disguised royal procession finally arrived in Madrid, their host presented them with impossible demands. The Duke of Buckingham got into terrible quarrels with the Spanish equivalent, and so Prince Charles had to negotiate for himself, hardly fitting for a future king. The whole business of adopting disguises as travelling gentlemen and calling yourself Mr. Smith and all this sort of thing, is, it's entirely silly, it's very adolescent. And, you know, going boating and dressing up and getting drunk, and I mean, it, you can imagine how that went down with, with a strict protocol of the court of Madrid, I mean, ridiculous, really, to think that, that anything other than disaster would come out of that. It soon became clear that the Spanish had been stringing Charles all along, just enough to keep England out of the Thirty Years' War. Charles was virtually cast out after bursting in on the young Infanta in her own private garden. The men returned home humiliated. The heat between those hills was such we thought ourselves in stoves. Yet at their heights we walked on snow, and colder it was than England in the midst of... Lank as shotten herring. They feed you not over there. At issue was not the quantity of fare, but its nature. Castile and Aragon together are not worth the meanest county in Wales. With Father's blessing, I shall see it published. Did he speak of my return at all? He is as much relieved of your safe arrival as the nation is of the princes, though perhaps with rather less dancing through the streets. I cannot imagine Father ever danced a jig in his life. No, not well, certainly. But come, tell me of it all. Tell me of Spain and the prince's great adventure. You despair of the English court, brother. It is as nothing to the severity of the Spanish. The prince had convinced himself he was in love 
but all chance of speaking with the Infanta was denied him. The public, however, were delighted by their failure. Eager to court this and embittered by their time in Spain, Charles and Buckingham switched sides. They pushed the reluctant James towards war with Spain. Parliament was summoned once again. This time, its anti-Spanish fervor was equaled by many at court. Despite this combined pressure, James still refused to go to war. But his ability to control events was diminishing. James was dying. Courtiers looked to the future, to Prince Charles, who would soon be king. By his side, in his endeavors, was Sir Richard, who would be promoted to first gentleman of the bedchamber. The Wynns had lost their firstborn son and heir at the same time as the Stuarts, the royal family. They were about to lose their patriarch at the same time as well. Sir John Wynne was also succumbing to the ravages of old age. 27th of March, 1625. Dear father, the king died this day at noon. He had been sick a fortnight with tertian fever. The stag that was dead yet lives. The young king was proclaimed this evening. He has promised he shall deal with me nobly, and I do believe a great office will be mine. I hope this letter finds you well and recovered of your recent sickness. Know that I endeavor each day to be worthy of your example, your dear and loyal son, Richard. In 1625, James dies. He's been ailing for quite a long time. He's been chronically unwell. Because of the way in which he sort of wastes away, and because of the way in which Buckingham is so hated by the political elite, of course, rumor spread very quickly that James had been poisoned. And in fact, Buckingham had, in defiance of the royal doctors, um, arranged for poultices to be applied to him, which it was easy for those that wanted to believe there was foul play, to believe there was foul play, and to a, a degree that historians have only recently begun to reevaluate the story that Buckingham had murdered James and that Charles had condoned it. Those haunted Charles right down to his own death 24 years later, and certainly were very prevalent in the months before the outbreak of civil war. Historians debate James's legacy. To some, he's an intelligent, a flawed man who brought peace in the time of extremism. To others, he was stubborn, extravagant, and his belief in the divine right of kings sowed the seeds for his son's own clashes with Parliament and the bitter English civil war that was to come. In the next episode, we see how Charles I followed in his father's footsteps with his profound belief in the divine right of kings and a misplaced trust in the Duke of Buckingham. Charles' shunning of Parliament and autocratic style of rule fueled enormous political and religious tensions in his kingdoms. A civil war would break out across the British Isles, and in the end, the House of Stuart would fall, and a Commonwealth, headed by a commoner called Oliver Cromwell, would rise in its place. The fall of the monarchy would be a nightmare for the Wynne family of North Wales. They would have to fight to survive in this new puritanical era. England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland would never be the same again. Charles I became King of England, Scotland and Ireland in 1625, succeeding his father, King James, the second Stuart monarch. Like his father, Charles believed in the divine right of kings and shunned Parliament as irrelevant. As a result, he had a tempestuous reign and eventually led to the outbreak of a civil war. 
Sir Richard Wynne was a confidant of the new King Charles I, and he was appointed groom of the bedchamber and gentleman of the privy chamber. Sir Richard Wynne and King Charles were long acquainted. Richard had even joined his future king on a pretty disastrous trip to Spain in 1623. Charles had hoped to negotiate his marriage to the Spanish Infanta, Maria Anna, daughter of King Philip III, but he was forced to return home humiliated. Charles's abject failure in Spain was an absolute delight to many back home. They did not want their future king marrying a Catholic. This was supposed to be a Protestant country now. However, Charles still ended up marrying a Catholic despite all of their protests. As he'd made his way to Spain on that fateful journey in 1623, he'd been to Paris and there he met Henrietta Maria, daughter of the King of France, Henry IV. So that hopeless journey abroad, trying to get the Spanish Infanta, had not been in vain. Charles and Henrietta Maria would be married in Canterbury in 1625. Henrietta Maria got married on the understanding with Pope Urban that she would try and do her best to bring England back to the true faith of Roman Catholicism and also the sort of um, understanding that she would do her best to influence the royal family itself, uh, the children that she would produce. The real problem was she was very zealously Catholic, so she flaunted her Catholicism, even to the extent that she refused to take part in the coronation because she would not have the proceedings overseen by a Protestant. It was something that was anathema to her. It's very puzzling if you're a modern person to find the answer to why it should have been such a source of contention that Charles, the first ever monarch to be brought up as a member of the Church of England, shouldn't have been married to a Roman Catholic. She was French. So you have really strong religious prejudices on the side of Queen Henrietta Maria and of a, a lot of people in political power in England. And it was, it would have needed somebody to back down and it wasn't going to be the politicians. In the year of the coronation of marriage, 1625, Sir Richard Wynne is supposed to have planted out these 12 saplings that he brought back from Spain in 1623, which are the famous cedars here at Buddha. There are three that survive. These are the earliest statement of royalism, which is gonna be a feature uh, throughout the 17th century of, of the relationship between the Wynns and, and the House of Stuart. This is the Queen's House in Greenwich. The building was designed by the great architect Inigo Jones and it was intended as a gift from King James I to his wife, Anne of Denmark. However, she died during its construction and the building was put on hold. Construction recommenced on the Queen's house when King Charles decided it would make a wonderful gift for his new wife, Henrietta Maria. A second level was even added by Inigo Jones and Henrietta became one of Inigo's key benefactors. Just like her husband, Henrietta Maria was a devoted patron of the arts. Fortunately for the Queen, she had Sir Richard Wynne as a treasurer to help fund her artistic endeavours. Sir Richard would sign off her payments and often paid with funds from his own estate. Sir Richard Wynne was now a firmly established figure in the Royal House of Stuart. Treasurer to the Queen Consort, groom of the bedchamber to the King. This meant he had the right to touch the King, a rare honour. Of course, this also meant he preparing the new King for his many portraits. One of the King's very favourite artists was the exceedingly popular Anthony Van Dyck. Have you sat for many portraits yourself, Richard? One or two, sire, though never for as skilled a man as Master Van Dyck. The better sort and no faster. Let us try that one. There is majesty in art. If there be a lesson I took from Spain, it is that my court should outshine all others, just as England should outshine all nations. Excepting Wales, sir. Of course, excepting Wales. It's difficult to understate the impact that this genius of portraiture had. He was like an impresario, crying action, 
And for the first time, people genuinely began to move in pictures. Uh, there was a feeling of illusion and realism in a way that Daniel Meutens had slightly prepared the English for, but Van Dyck swept the board with. I mean, one of the first things that he did, and Charles I, of course, was highly aware of the possibilities of an artist like Van Dyck. He collected the works of Titian. Uh, he uh, was familiar and through osmosis of, 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 of contact with the works of the High Renaissance. He knew that there were ways of portraying him and his court uh, in a way that was different from the past. No. No, it will not do. Take it away. Forgive me, sire. Did you fashion the collar, Richard? No, sire. Purchase it for my wardrobe? No, sir. Never make defense or apology before you be accused. Advice fit for statesmen, courtiers, and husbands. We shall try another. Physically speaking, he was not prepossessing. He had a slightly gnomish face, very pronounced, slightly goggly eyes. He was also very small. He was five foot four. He had bow legs. Uh, he had rickets when he was young. And so he needed an artist to transform this rather unprepossessing human form into something magnificent. And I, I genuinely feel that when you look at those portraits of Charles I, Van Dyck has elevated him with a subtle manipulation of the brush into an almost Christ-like figure. Van Dyck brought with him this, this box of tricks from the High Renaissance, and he dumped them down in London. And with all the tools, all the insights, all the technical brilliance and proficiency, all the sort of poetic mood that he was able to imbue his sitters with, he transformed the way we looked. Despite a whirlwind start to his reign, Charles faced the same difficulties as his father. King James I, a strange relationship with Parliament and an urgent need to raise funds to end popular taxes would force his reign into extreme tensions. With the Thirty Years' War raging on the continent, it wouldn't be long before the country plunged into its own civil war and blood would flow. Sir Richard Wynne, the owner of Gwydir Castle here in North Wales, inherited his property and his titles from his father, Sir John Wynne. Richard's brother Owen was a bookish type, interested in a variety of subjects, including the mysterious business of alchemy. Owen preferred to stay here at the family home of Gwydir, while Richard was busy in the court of the new king, Charles I. King Charles's reign had started at a frantic pace. He married Henrietta Maria, daughter of the King of France, just a couple of months after gaining the throne and was already planning a war with Spain after those failed attempts to marry the Spanish Infanta. But Charles had inherited the same problems as his father, a poor relationship with Parliament and a misplaced trust in a particular figure at court, the Duke of Buckingham. He'd been a favourite of King James and had retained a considerable amount of influence over King Charles as well. There was a sort of intense friendship, which I think started on both sides from a mutual regard of how powerful the other one was. You know, Buckingham because of his royal favour, which he certainly didn't want to lose with the change of uh, ruler. And Charles because he wanted to be loved by his father and what better way of being loved than to show favour for his favourite. There was a sort of element of intelligence on both parts that diplomatically they should make the most of each other because it was going to further their own interest. Uh, but after James's death, Buckingham maintained this extraordinary hold over the throne for the remaining three years of Buckingham's life. From the very beginning, Charles and Parliament don't get on. Distrust builds very, very quickly not least because Charles is pouring money into failed military campaigns led by Buckingham. And Parliament doesn't see why it should continue to give money. He starts raising monies under his prerogative in ways which are truly controversial. 
it is one of the major issues which generates the distrust of Charles that is going to be the background of factors for a civil war a few years later. Despite a lack of finances, Charles pressed ahead with his intervention in the Thirty Years' War and an expedition was launched against Spain. Buckingham oversaw an alliance with the Dutch and the plan was effectively to engage in piracy by raiding Spanish treasure ships returning from the New World with gold and then to attack Spanish towns in order to drag the country out of the Thirty Years' War. It was a complete disaster. Through bad luck and incompetence, at least 1,000 English soldiers died with nothing to show for it. People blamed the already unpopular Duke of Buckingham. The record parliament mooted impeaching him and Charles dismissed them, spare his friend. But he couldn't protect the Duke of Buckingham from all the threats. On the 23rd of August, 1628, Buckingham was stabbed to death in Portsmouth by a disgruntled army officer. Charles and the court mourned Buckingham deeply, but the rest of the country pretty much celebrated his death. The rift between king and country was growing deeper. One of the officers, Felton, who had been on his first mission, stabbed him to death. And Buckingham knew that the wound was fatal. He actually called it out. The shock in this country of the greatest non-royal in the country being just commonly assassinated was something absolutely astonishing. Uh, a lot of people didn't like the influence Buckingham had, but the thought of him suddenly being gone at the, the blade of an assassin was, was something that took a lot of coming to terms with. Once Buckingham was dead, Sir Richard Wynne was one of King Charles' most trusted advisers. But he could also be viewed as one of the king's greatest benefactors. Richard's father, Sir John Wynne, had been offered a baronetcy by King James and bought it at a hefty price. Only Parliament could levy taxes, so Stuart monarchs had to find new, inventive ways of acquiring funds if they were going to ignore Parliament, as King Charles liked to do. He generated new income through the highly unpopular ship money levy. This was essentially a tax intended for wartime, but it was now levied during peacetime. It had only been imposed on counties that lay on the coast, but it was now implied inland as well. Families like the Winds would be the ones footing this massive tax bill. Drawn up by Master Inigo Jones himself. It's a bridge by the surveyor to his majesty. I'm surprised the king can spare him. He must be a man much occupied. A generosity typical of his character. 25 shillings and fourpence. What? 25 shillings and fourpence. That's the king's demand, oh, apologies, generosity, that arrived this morning courtesy of the sheriff. Ship money owed on our rectory. Are we to dispute over 25 shillings? That is but the latest demand, brother. We bear the Queen's debts, we pay the King's ship money. Were it not for the Irish estates, we The would King be... must have means. To gild his palace while our roofs fall in. Whitehall is dilapidated. It shames the nation. The nation has other concerns. I've seen the pamphlets. The printing press may echo a voice a thousand times over. It is still but one man. Do not be swayed by malefactors in London. The nation is happy. I think one of the tragedies for the Stuarts is that they never had enough money. And Parliament wasn't prepared to give enough or to tax enough in their own way. Charles I was very keen to get round this problem and to use whatever device he could come up with. Uh, anything that connected to the Crown to raise money, he would look at. And ship money was the first really big disaster in terms of confrontation with people who were not prepared to put up with what they saw as an abuse of kingly power. There is a case for it. There was a big European war going on. 20,000 English young people mainly are, are being captured by pirates coming from North Africa and taking them off to be slaves in North Africa. Charles I, in fairness, was building up the, the navy in a, in a very dramatic way, which was good for the nation. But to impose a tax on internal counties of England for the growing of the navy was a really difficult concept. 
for uh, people who are being asked to pay it. He will not recall Parliament then? Why let that disputatious gathering disturb the peace? I have conducted alchemic investigations these many years. Vapours, foul and copious, are a near constant. In the naivety of my youth, I sought once to contain those airs, lest farther catch upon the breeze a hint of my designs. I remember. I capped a fermenting bottle, yet my attempts at amelioration only worsened the explosion when it came. Parliament is the bottle? The country is the bottle. I fear the long containment of grievance without safe release will bring us all to greater misfortune. The King may rule without Parliament, so ever long he wishes. It's not his prerogative, I doubt, brother, but his wisdom. Hmm. It is a very fine bridge. To do it without consulting Parliament and then say, well, I have a right in a national emergency to raise these sorts of monies, when, in fact, there's time to call a Parliament is to abuse your power. It was just the first major step of Charles being seen as an absolutist monarch in an unacceptable, very un-British way. The Thirty Years' War had begun as a religious conflict between Catholic and Protestant states. And although King Charles had disengaged from the conflict, the religious divisions within his own kingdoms did not disappear. England, Wales, Ireland and Scotland all had their own unique and combustible mix of Catholics and Protestants. Many also suspected Charles of secret Catholic sympathies. His wife was French. His attempts to help Protestant allies in Europe were seen as half-hearted. And together with his Archbishop of Canterbury, William Lord, Charles passed a series of anti-Calvinist reforms. These were particularly unpopular in Scotland. In 1639, the church and public there rebelled. Charles couldn't stand this affront to his authority, but he didn't have the funds to raise an adequate army. Scottish forces swept into England, seizing Northumberland and forcing the king to pay them for the privilege. Charles had no choice but to recall Parliament. Humiliated by the Scots and backed into a corner by his finances, Charles could not dismiss the members this time and the men of Parliament quickly moved against Charles's government. Advisers were impeached and new acts were passed, preventing the king from ruling alone in the way he had done. The times seem as a man with the ague. Some days good, some days bad. I see not the good. The remedy, as ever, is best found at home. Executing Chief Minister Strafford has purchased not a moment's respite. Had His Majesty not called Parliament last year, I do believe the Earl of Warwick would have marched on London. Now, bit by bit, they gnaw away at his prerogative. An act for preventing the long intermission of Parliaments, an act declaring ship money unlawful and void, an act for the regulation of the Privy Council. His Majesty is most sensible of the disrespect. He will brook it, though. He says it is but a few malcontents goading and leading the rabble on. I'm sure he has it right. Come home, brother. If it turns to conflict, I would not have you here in London. My place is with His Majesty. Tensions were reaching boiling point in Ireland. Terrible killings took place between Catholics and Protestants. Rumours abounded. Parliament wanted to impeach Charles's Catholic wife, Henrietta Maria, for collusion with the rebels. That, for the king, was the last straw. Charles marched on the House of Commons with an armed guard to arrest who he thought were his enemies, the opposition ringleaders. But the Speaker refused to surrender the MPs. Not long afterwards, Charles left London, which was increasingly hostile to him. Further negotiations with Parliament failed. Soon, both sides were raising armies. At Nottingham, on the 22nd of August, 1642, Charles raised the royal standard. The English Civil War had begun. 
In order for there to be an English civil war, there has to be a collapse of authority in Ireland and Scotland first. You have to send an army to Ireland in order to safeguard uh, the, the Protestants who've not been massacred. Uh, you can't trust the king with that army, but the king can't possibly be expected to, as king, to give over the power to control armies to, to a parliament that is a legislative body, it's not an executive body. So that becomes the non-negotiable issue in which all the tensions in England burst forth into violence. I see the civil war coming from a shifting of tectonic plates to do with politics, society and religion. There were very, very bloody things going on in the continent which show the, the intensity of religious feeling on both sides. There was a similar feeling over here about what is right religiously and people believe passionately to the point of death in their particular brand of Christianity. I think one of the things about Charles I, almost his besetting sin, was tactlessness. They were so in love with their idea of what the church was and how it could be beautified that they were stupidly intolerant of the Puritans. Definitely, there was a class of people in the political sphere of England who believed that they should be representing the interests of the country versus the court. And uh, equally vehemently, you have Charles I and before him, James I, believing absolutely rigidly in the divine right of kings. So there's a sort of religious conflict and a philosophical one about who's actually in charge of this country and what is it about. Come. Everything is ready, Your Majesty. Do you know what they say of me, Richard, in these pamphlets? I do not read them, sire. They say I plot with Rome, that I conspire for the propagation of popery in my kingdoms. They are seditious, sire. They are vain, lewd, and wicked. But fire must with fire be matched. I have ordered a printing press be conveyed to Oxford with the court. Very wise, sire. Our own newsletter where they entice with empty falsehood, we shall nourish with the truth. So equipped will the people shake off their current sickness and better affection be to their king. I shall return, Richard, and to such a welcome. The stage was set for civil war. Charles on one side, Parliament on the other. Charles's belief in the divine right of kings was about to be severely tested. Charles set up his capital in Oxford. His strength lay in the north and west, whereas Parliament had the wealth in London and the southeast and control of the navy. The initial battles of the Civil War were pretty much a draw, alongside intermittent and futile peace talks. Father. Father. Is it from Uncle Richard? Father, what news of the war? Well, it's from one of our tenants. Oh. A clothier. He cannot pass army lines to reach market in Shrewsbury. Our drovers cannot take their cattle into England either. Perhaps they should fight instead, if their lord would not forbid it. Wisely, they keep themselves apart. And no matter if people think them cowards, if people talk of them so. Were I to hear such a word, I would correct it very seriously. I think the Royalists were in the ascendant from the summer of 1642 until Marston Moor in 1644, marginally. I think the energy of the Royalists was quite impressive, but the fundamentals were against the Royalists the longer the war went on. Uh, the Navy being for Parliament and London being for Parliament. And then when the Scots came in, that was really the turning point. He did believe in the divine right of kings. He believed he was placed there by God. It was his destiny uh, as an anointed king to be the supreme head of the British state. Whereas the Puritans fed with this Hebraic idea uh, that there is only one king namely Almighty God, um, disputed the idea that Charles Stuart, that man of blood, as they called him, uh, should make any such claim. 
I am a man grown. We've spoken about this. Is it not my duty to serve the king? <sighs> These people live in the mountains. They sow no crop. Their livelihood is in cloth, in cattle. Only by reaching market can they pay the rent. Only with their rent can we support the king. That is our duty. It is yours. You cannot stop me. But most of these drovers, these clothiers, are too old for the fight. They are perhaps fearful of losing what they hold dear. That does not mean that they have forgotten what it is to be young and eager. I want to fight. Sixteen forty five was a turning point in the civil war that had so far been a stalemate. Many in Parliament were unhappy that their advantage in resources hadn't translated into victory. They suspected some commanders of half hearted leadership. They demanded change. So, in January sixteen forty five, the new model army was founded. It was to be professional, well trained, a national army not limited to one geographical area like the old militia. And promotion was to be based on merit, not on social status. The new model army first took to the field in late spring 1645 under the command of Sir Thomas Fairfax and Oliver Cromwell. Its first major battle was on 14th of June at Naseby where it faced the king's smaller but more experienced force. The result, a stunning victory for the new parliamentary force. Naseby in Northamptonshire, that's the one which really settles it because once the king's main marching army has been destroyed and his wonderful, wonderful infantry, there's no way to come back for him. The amount of territory he now occupies is too little to support the war effort. The emergence of the new model army, his first great victory at Naseby, is a clear sign that Parliament now has an instrument that will ensure that they will not lose the benefits of their great victory in the middle of Northamptonshire. That Naseby defeat robbed Charles of his best men, his artillery, his stores, and his grip over the royalist heartland of the West Country. Charles retreated to his capital, Oxford. Later, Charles headed for Conway Valley in North Wales, where he had loyal support. It's believed that he came here to Gwydir Castle upon the invitation of Sir Richard Wynne. Sir Richard Wynne was at the side of King Charles as his brother Owen received this message at Gwydir. He ever was an unfortunate king. Had the winds been otherwise in 28, a fine victory might have been his in France. Instead, he was garlanded with humiliation. Now, defeat hurries quick upon defeat. His last port is besieged and his forces spent. And word comes he would seek refuge here at Gwydir. to receive a king. That is an honor even I can recognize. Yet, danger slips through an open door. Offer your hand to a drowning man, you may be pulled down with him. Paint ourselves too lurid a royal hue, and we mark ourselves as the victor's prize. But will Guida at the last reject Caesar? <laughs> Should peace be struck, his kingdom retained, he may remember the friends that betrayed him with more rancor than the enemies that fought him. Alchemic reaction once begun cannot so easily be undone. Yet, they will have an answer. There was this king who was a charming man, had lots of good qualities, religious, thoughtful, very good family man, but a terrible king, and one who had taken very poor advice at a lot of key junctures. 
Uh, the problem with Charles was he was just so weak. And it used to drive Henrietta Maria mad. You see her letters to him from the safety of the continent saying, you agreed to do this, but you did that yet again. What are you doing? And he couldn't help himself. He just was easily swayable. And this was not a, a decade, the 1640s, where you could have a weak king and hope for a good outcome for the country or for him. King Charles was running out of options. He was forced to surrender to the Scottish army on the 5th of May, 1646. And after months of negotiation, Charles was given up into the custody of the English parliament, essentially taken to prison. Charles didn't give up hope. He knew about growing divisions between the Scots and the English, and between parliament and the new model army. So he had a plan. He made a secret agreement with the Scots they would invade England and, with the help of the remaining royalist forces, return Charles to the throne. In return, Charles would establish a Scottish Presbyterian religion in England. The king, having lost the war, tries to win the peace. I mean, he tries to play off his enemies against one another. But it's not impossible that couldn't have worked. If he'd been a little bit more flexible in 1647, he could probably have made a deal with the army, and the army would have put him back on the throne. Uh, in return, what they were demanding was complete religious freedom, um, that there should be complete liberty. And that was better for him, I think, than having a Presbyterian, strict Scottish-style um, church government. He could have had an, a weak, um, Episcopalian system, you know, Church of England, a weak Church of England, but with complete freedom outside it, and he, he doesn't take that opportunity. The Second Civil War flamed into life in 1648, but it was brief. The new model army put down the Royalist rebellions before defeating the Scottish forces at Preston in August. Charles was forced to negotiate. But those divisions between the new model army and parliament had not gone away. Parliament voted narrowly to continue negotiating with the king. But by now, the army and Oliver Cromwell thought Charles a tyrant who had to be removed. Choosing between the radical demands of the army and a king who surely is chastened and wiser than he was when we first fought him, faced by that, the army has a choice, and the army decides that God will not forgive them if they put man of blood, this man who had caused all this suffering for his people, if they put him back on the throne. So the army occupies London, it purges parliament, it removes a majority of MPs and it puts the king on trial. When finally the king is taken, it's interesting that Sir Richard Wynne, of course, as well as his royal duties, was an MP. He then has to watch the, the slow unravelling of the royalist cause. And he'd been in his service for all these years um, already when he was prince uh, and going all the way through, having carried his robes at the coronation, having been with him uh, on a drunken jaunt in Spain, having done all those things with the king and then ultimately with the queen later. Uh, it must have been terrifyingly difficult for anyone to cope with. There was a strong element of parliament who were not in favor of the king being tried on any level. It was a huge jump for people mentally to go from the king that they had always been taught as being a representative of God and a, a figure of great awe even though he had been defeated in battle repeatedly, and even though he was reneging on agreements, he was still the king. And to a lot of loyalist members of parliament, they could understand a, a way forward where the king might be persuaded to be a more acceptable form of himself. The trial of a king was something new in England. No existing court thought the trial legal, so Parliament had to create a special body to try Charles, and it met for the first time in Westminster Hall on the 20th of January, 1649. Charles was accused of high treason, held responsible for all the death and destruction caused by the war. Of course, 
Charles didn't recognize the court's authority. He refused to enter a plea, insisting the trial was not only illegal by English law, but against God as well. The colonels of the New Model Army were the dominant force, really, in the trial of Charles I. They had seen too much bloodshed, and they could then only see Charles as this famous phrase, this man of blood. He was no longer Charles, King of England, on a pedestal. He was just another man who had caused this appalling bloodshed. And I think it's always worth remembering that the English Civil Wars, they caused the heaviest loss of life percentage of population in this country ever, including the First World War. And the casualties were even worse in Scotland and considerably worse in Ireland. So I think that with all that in mind, people thought those who hated the king by this stage or who certainly loathed the bloodshed that went with the king's cause, I think they thought that if we can just lop the head off, literally, the, 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 the crown, then we could have a, a fresh start and, and no more blood. The court sentenced Charles to death. He bade farewell to his children who were with him to the end. He requested two shirts so that he would not shiver from the cold and so give the impression of being afraid. The king was beheaded on a scaffold outside Banqueting House in Whitehall on the 30th of January, 1649. You look tired. Are you there? When they... Richard. May we all meet our deaths in so steadfast a spirit. Did they grant him any last words? The soldiers kept us at a far remove. A scaffold had been erected. It was at the banqueting house, designed by Master Jones. Like our bridge. I could not hear what he said. I saw him speak a prayer, then kneel at the block, hands outstretched before him. When the axe fell, the crowd gave out a moan, as I never heard before, and desire I may never do so again. Charles, king and martyr. Charles. It's interesting that Sir Richard Wynne just sort of fizzles out and a few months after the execution of the king, he's dead, he's dead himself. In the 19th century, they would have romantically said he died of a broken heart, but he really had no purpose. He sort of fizzled out. It's a sort of unspecific illness. I think he just wasted away, probably through grief. The House of Lords was abolished and executive power wielded by Parliament and its Council of State. The new model army was the most powerful force in Britain. With Oliver Cromwell in command, it swept aside all remaining military opposition. In 1653, Cromwell disbanded Parliament. He thought it quarrelsome and ineffective and seized power as Lord Protector. In the end, the bloody English civil war between King and Parliament saw both sides lose. All the while, across the sea, Charles's son and heir waited in exile. In the next episode of The Stuarts, A Bloody Reign, the heir to the throne, Charles II, goes into hiding on the continent, where he is stunned by the news that his father has been put to death. For over a decade, Charles travels in exile around the royal houses of Europe, planning to overthrow Cromwell's Commonwealth and restore the House of Stuart. But his attempts are in vain, and it seemed all hopes are lost. However, the tides begin to turn back in the Stuarts' favour with the death of Cromwell, and soon 
Charles II will be welcomed with open arms by an adoring public in London. The restoration of the monarchy sees a return to prominence for the Wynne family as well. But there are many enormous obstacles to overcome, including a huge outbreak of the dreaded plague and the Great Fire of London. Charles I was executed on the 30th of January 1649. The Royalists had lost the Civil War. The reign of the Stuarts appeared over. The entire system of monarchy appeared over. In its place was now the Commonwealth, a new system of government where England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland were ruled over by Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector. The hero of the New Model Army is Oliver Cromwell, and he had a spectacular career. From the minute he gets into Parliament as the poorest man to make it to Parliament in 1640, he is a dynamo. I mean, he's a man totally committed to godly reformation, completely convinced of the fact that God has called him to some great cause. And he just rises from being a captain in 1642 and then becomes the Lieutenant General and the head of the cavalry for the New Model Army. Eventually, of course, the, the head of the whole army leading unparalleled the successful and brutal campaigns in Ireland and Scotland. After the execution of Charles I, his wife, Henrietta Maria, had to escape and found refuge in the French court. His son, Charles, attempted to muster forces in France and the Netherlands. They became royal prey. They were pursued out of the country. Henrietta Maria fled in a ship from the southwest to France under gunfire from Parliament. The future James II, as a young boy, managed to escape from Sion House uh, in Middlesex dressed as a girl and was spirited away to the Netherlands. And um, there was a little Princess Elizabeth who sadly sort of faded away and died in Carisbrook Castle in, in the Isle of Wight. Between 1646 and 51, the future Charles II endures a really humiliating exile. The story is that nobody dared tell Charles II that his father had been executed and they didn't know what to do. So one of the senior courtiers went in to see Charles II, and instead of saying, Your Royal Highness, which would have been his title as prince, bowed and said, Your Majesty, meaning you are now the king. And Charles took a moment to understand it, but when he did, it was uh, an absolute body blow. The Wynne family at Gwydir Castle were deeply affected by the execution of Charles I. Sir Richard Wynne had lost both his king and his seat at Parliament, as he'd been expelled by the Pride's Purge of 1648, orchestrated by Oliver Cromwell. Sir Richard was heartbroken. He would never recover, and he died just a few months after King Charles was beheaded. Succeeding Sir Richard as the new head of the Wynne family would be his younger brother, Sir Owen Wynne. Owen was a very different character, bookish, endlessly intrigued by the possibilities of alchemy. It wasn't easy for poor old Sir Owen Wynne. He was the third son, and he was the more bookish one. He wasn't the sort of glamorous courtier as his brother Richard had been. And so he was given all the kind of difficult jobs. He had to look after the estate for his brother. His brother gave him an allowance to do so. And he was at the brunt of it here during the Civil War he and, of course, Lady Grace, his wife. So it can't have been easy during the Civil War, having all of this going on, being twice sacked, being seriously squeezed in terms of finances. Sir Owen had to be especially careful under this new Commonwealth. The Wynne family had been close to the deposed Royal House of Stuart, and there was a very real threat that the Wynne estate could be seized by force at any moment just like royalist families up and down the country. Following the end of the English Civil War and the battles that occurred across Wales, Scotland and Ireland, known as the War of the Three Kingdoms, 
Oliver Cromwell had firmly established his grip on power. He'd been sworn in as Lord Protector in 1653 and drastically altered the cultural landscape of the country. Theatre was outlawed, celebration of Christmas and Easter was banned. For quite a lot of the 1650s, Oliver Cromwell is ruling England as Lord Protector, refusing to take the title of king, but very much like a king. And his policy of, of promoting religious liberty, you know, does benefit a lot of people, including, of course, former Anglicans and even Catholics, who have a much easier time under Cromwell than they had under any of the Stuarts. If Cromwell had lived beyond his 60th birthday, there's a real possibility that the, the Stuart option might have faded away. In 1658, Oliver Cromwell fell ill and died, and was succeeded by his son, Richard Cromwell. But Richard lacked any real authority, because if the position of Lord Protector could be inherited, so how was that any different from the monarchy? A power vacuum was developing, and the Booth Rebellion was one of several attempts to fill it. Sir George Booth was a former member of Parliament who organised an uprising against Richard Cromwell in 1659. Joining him in his efforts would be another former member of Parliament, Sir Thomas Middleton, and Middleton's son-in-law, Sir Richard Wynne the Younger, son of Sir Owen. The Booth Rebellion had been planned in the regions near Gwydir Castle, North Wales, and the northwest of England. The forces assembled were able to take the important city of Chester, but although Cromwell's power was undoubtedly failing and the Commonwealth was weak, Booth's rebellion was still put down. Booth himself managed to escape capture dressed as a woman, but Sir Richard Wynne was not quite so fortunate. When Booth's revolt happens in 1659, it is Sir Thomas Middleton and Sir Richard Wynne they are rising North Wales at the same time as George Booth is rising Cheshire. It was supposed to happen all over Britain. But the problem is, these were the only two areas that did rise, so the full weight of the New Model Army under General Lambert were there waiting for them, and they didn't stand a chance, as you can imagine. Um, Sir Richard Wynne is, is uh, caught in the uh, fallout of that, obviously. He's one of the casualties of being mopped up and uh, he's dragged off to Carnarvon Castle, uh, where he's a prisoner. I would have had you in the dungeon. Mother, I did not think to see you. My keeper permits me no letters. I've met the Colonel. He's a villain, is he not? I found him amenable. He is Parliament's creature. Courtesy will loosen a door rather than spite Richard and a ready purse is more persuasive still. I think he will see you released. His expectation was to be courted. I'm in no mood for wooing. Perhaps you were enjoying your little game too much. There was a time to end this tyranny under which we live, Mother, if General Monk had joined but us. But he did not. He waited to see how the die would fall. Parliament and the army are in dispute. Our king may return and our prayers rest upon that hope. But some new Lord Protector may rise in Cromwell's place. We have weathered this long darkness, estate and family intact, but you do not throw away your winter garb at the first bud of spring. Snows may return as quickly as they are banished. You were of no use to me here. Recall the habits of a courting youth and practice them upon the Colonel. My purse will do the rest. The failure of the Booth Rebellion, a terrible blow to Sir Richard Wynne the Younger and all royalists across the country. Even in its weakened state, Cromwell's Commonwealth had somehow hung on. But their disappointment wouldn't last for long. Across the English Channel, King Charles I's son and heir was patiently waiting in exile. Within a year, he'd be summoned back to London and a new Stuart King would be back on the throne. The rebellion of 1659 had failed to bring down the Commonwealth, but it hadn't been totally in vain. The actions of Sir George Booth, Sir Thomas Middleton, and Sir Richard Wynne the Younger had inspired another key figure of the era, 
George Monk, Governor of Scotland. Monk was a man of floating allegiance. At one point, he considered defending Richard Cromwell. Later, he thought of joining Booth's Rebellion. But now, in 1660, he was launching his own uprising. He led his army of loyal soldiers down from Scotland to London, and no one could stop him. He became the most powerful man in the country. But Monk was not in the mould of Oliver Cromwell. There would be no new Lord Protector. He made overtures to the Stuart family in exile. They were the only ones who could offer the country the stability it so desperately needed. General Monk realised that the mood in the country was fed up with Cromwell, fed up with the rule of the major generals. The army had stopped being on the side of the revolution. The army was reverting to the king. And once that happened, there was no hope of keeping Richard Cromwell. He didn't have any of his father's bullying strength. He was a quieter man. And anyway, there's something absurd if you've given up the concept of monarchy, thinking that there should be a hereditary protectorate. Even though the Great Rising didn't happen and it was put down, nevertheless, all eyes were on it. And at that moment, George Monk makes his move. And he could have been king, of course. And in fact, the throne was offered to him um, tentatively in, that, uh, in the way of him becoming the, the inheritor of the uh, protectorship. Uh, but wisely, he decided, no, it's much better to be the kingmaker than the king. So he is the, the grand choreographer who brings Charles back or enables uh, Charles to come back. Of course, Charles doesn't actually win back the throne. It's Parliament and the Commonwealth that lose it. They haven't got somebody to succeed Oliver Cromwell, who has the substance or the respect of both Parliament and the army to take his place. So it's really because of Oliver Cromwell's death and the inability of anyone following him to grab that power that eventually the English resort to default and think, well, we'll have a king back then. Charles had spent most of his exile in the Dutch city of Breda, and on the 4th of April, 1660, he issued the Declaration of Breda, promising a general pardon for crimes committed during the Civil War, recognition of property rights, religious toleration, and payment of army wage arrears. Four days later, the Parliament in London proclaimed Charles King. At once, the young exile made preparations in Europe to return home. Charles II and his advisers, they were convinced that uh, if there were conditions, they were going to be very onerous. And they'd be probably close to what Charles I had turned down before his trial and execution. But actually, the English Parliament had turned around on its head in just two months in early 1660. So although he has promised everything be settled by Parliament, he is returned unconditionally. I mean, Parliament passes the declaration that he has been king since the moment of the death of his father of royal memory. So they say, come back unconditionally, but thank you for your promise that you will accept any settlement we make on the most uh, neuralgic terms. Charles landed at Dover on May the 25th. He made his way to London, which he reached four days later. He had deliberately timed it so that he'd re-enter the city on his birthday. He was exactly 30 years old. The people of London were lining the streets. The crowds were so thick that it took seven hours to cross the still familiar city. Perhaps some of them had been there that cold January morning, more than a decade earlier, when the king's father had been beheaded in Whitehall. Now they were cheering the return of the Stuarts. Charles II had come home to claim his crown. So great a multitude. And in so merry a spirit too holding the king's picture aloft that was near a hanging matter but weeks ago. It must be all of London. We shall know of his coming from the crowd. They line the streets like this from Dover to Whitehall. In all the years of Cromwell, did you ever see such a thing? No. Nor can I remember when last we two had an afternoon of leisure such as this. He will be a fine king. 
I'm sure of it. Despite the general pardon offered by Charles in his declaration at Breda, not every crime was forgotten. 50 people were deliberately excluded from Charles' acts of forgiveness. Nine men who'd signed his father's death warrant were executed. The identity of the executioner who actually carried out the beheading of King Charles I is still a mystery to this day. As for Oliver Cromwell, the man who usurped Charles' father, even after death, he would be held accountable. As would the judge who oversaw Charles' trial, John Bradshaw, and Henry Ireton, who'd signed the King's death warrant. The three of them were removed from their graves and hung up for the crowds to witness before they were all decapitated and their heads placed on spikes. There was one part of him that was unforgiving, and that was his attitude towards those who had been involved in the death of his father. And that's the 59 men who signed the death warrant, and another 20 or so who were either legal officers in the court case or on the scaffold at the execution. And Charles's hatred for them never ended. The people he most blames for his father's death, their heads were cut off and their bodies thrown into a lime pit and the heads stuck on spikes on the Palace of Westminster. I think he just adored his father and couldn't believe that these people could expect any sort of sympathy at all. And there was also an underlying point too, that if he had been soft with them, what would it have said about him as a, as a, as a monarch? So I think that there was a cold part of Charles II and it was absolutely focused on those who had killed his father. Life would change drastically with the return of the king. Puritan repression was lifted almost at once. A new age of liberty and even debauchery took hold. Amid a dazzling cultural rebirth, poetry and the arts would prosper, theatres reopened with women appearing on stage for the first time. The sciences flourished as well, with luminaries such as Sir Isaac Newton and Robert Boyle, expanding the horizons of human knowledge. I think there was an enormous mood of optimism when Charles II came back, partly because he did this clever thing. He was prepared to tolerate an awful lot of people who had supported the Civil War. And therefore, because he was a genial uh, person on some, on some levels, and certainly politically very intelligent, um, he was able to create an atmosphere in which political reconciliation could happen. Charles is very keen to work with as many people who'd worked with Cromwell as possible. He wants to see healing and settling. His former enemies were much more likely to send him on his travels again than his former friends. He'd rather disappoint his friends than his enemies because his aim is not to have to go away again. Charles himself will be the founder of the Royal Observatory, which you can see here in this painting from its earliest days. He had an interest in the burgeoning field of natural sciences, and he would grant a charter to the Royal Society. Sir Owen Wynne would not get to see much of the Restoration. He died in the same year as King Charles II was crowned. The period that Sir Owen Wynne had lived under so cautiously in the last years of his life was now called the Interregnum. Sir Owen's son, Sir Richard Wynne the Younger, freshly released from Carnarvon Castle, inherited the Wynne estate. Sir Richard Wynne's uncle had been such a key figure in the court of Charles I. There was no reason to believe that the Wynne family would not prosper once again, now that the Stuarts were back. King Charles II was finally on the throne and he needed a queen. During the reign of King Charles I, there'd been negotiations with the royal family of Portugal for the hand of Catherine of Braganza. This arrangement had been put on permanent hold thanks to Oliver Cromwell, but it was brought back to life following the Restoration. King Charles II married Catherine of Braganza in 1662 and a nation of tea drinkers was born. 
Catherine brought over the custom of tea drinking from Portugal and it quickly became popular amongst the aristocracy in the reign of King Charles II. Sir Richard Wynne the Younger would be a key part of this restored royal court, taking up the position of Chamberlain to Charles' new queen. A delighted nation dubbed the new king the Merry Monarch, but just like his father, Charles had married a Catholic, and the religious difficulties that had so blighted the past did not simply disappear. However, there were far more pressing problems just around the corner. The worst outbreak of plague since the Black Death and the Great Fire of London. Your fire was dying. Lady Grace, let me summon the maid. I have brought it back to life. It is quite all right. I can manage a fire. Sit. I thought I heard the footpost not long ago. Yet I know that cannot be. I forbade the London Post from approaching our gates, and none would be so disrespectful as to disobey my wishes. Do not blame the poor man. No, I do not. You commanded him and he obeyed as he should. I had not heard from Richard in so very long. He lives then. The existence of the letter was all you needed to know that. I fear it is very bad this time. I remember the plague in 1625. I was younger than you, not long married. Old Sir John kept carts of London cloth outside for days at a time, happier as he was to see his finest purchases ruined than risk plague within our walls. He must be destroyed. It is one letter. Let us pass through what hands and what parts of the country we know not. Every moment it is in this house, the danger deepens. I will have it removed from you if I must. In 1665, the Great Plague of London hit the city. There had been large outbreaks throughout the 17th century, particularly in 1625 and 1636, but nothing as bad as this. It would be the last major outbreak of the disease to occur in England. A quarter of the population of the capital died in little over a year. Plague had been something they'd all lived with forever. It's something that they were pretty wised up to, and there are accounts of bolts of cloth, for example, being sent up from London, which would be kept outside the gates of Gwydda for up to two weeks. So the carters would not be allowed into the, uh, the, main, the great court. Uh, they'd be kept outside by the porter, and they would observe for two weeks. They knew that one thing was certain, if you have an infected cargo that came into somewhere like Gwydda, the house would get it. King Charles II and the family escaped to Salisbury and England's Parliament relocated to Oxford. By the spring of 1666, the outbreak had died down and it was deemed safe for the Stuarts to return to London. But just as life was returning to normal, yet another disaster unfolded. The Great Fire of London broke out on the 2nd of September, 1666. What began in a Pudding Lane bakery spread out of control and burned for three days straight. The fires gutted the medieval heart of the city and the ancient St Paul's Cathedral was utterly destroyed. Fears abounded that the fire was a foreign plot and King Charles II worried that the entire city might fall into anarchy. England was at war with the Netherlands at the time. 
The Dutch saw the fire as a divine retribution for the actions of the English Navy and Rear Admiral Robert Holmes, who'd set the town of West Telesing ablaze in what became known as Holmes's Bonfire. The disasters that befell Charles, the hammer blow of the plague, the fire, the wars with the Dutch. Meanwhile, the people of England were predominantly in favor of the Dutch, so he was out of kilter with the political feeling of, 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 his, uh, of his parliament for a lot of his reign. These were terrible things because the mentality of the time was somehow that the, the monarch was responsible for life, for everyday life. King Charles II was facing battles on all fronts, just like the Stuart kings who'd come before him. His capital burned to the ground, the economy in the doldrums. The only reason why he'd gone to war in the first place was to try to help the economy. The Dutch Republic was in the midst of its golden age, lucrative trade routes across the globe. Charles's younger brother James had suggested they seize lucrative colonial possessions from the Dutch, disrupt their trading dominance. Charles agreed he was keen for a popular war to boost his standing. The war was not a success. The Netherlands may have been a smaller nation, but it had a far superior navy and much more money. Disasters such as the Great Fire of London further sapped England's ability to prosecute the war. By 1667, the Dutch controlled much of the waters around the south of England. They'd secured pivotal European alliances, and that June, they staged a devastatingly bold naval assault, dubbed the Raid on the Medway. They attacked the English fleet at anchor in the mouth of the Thames. Many ships were destroyed, and it remains one of the greatest disasters in the history of the Royal Navy. Charles, crushed, had to sue for peace. Royal Oak burned, the Loyal London and the Royal James too. The flagship carried off without a single shot fired in her defence. I thought the Dutch are much lesser power than England. We are the more numerous, but they are richer, and they have directed their wealth with far greater wisdom. Since the last war, they've rebuilt their navy and plain made expert study of river navigation and warfare. And what have we done? beggared our garrisons with masks and courtly merriments. I have no place there. Then be done with London. Go not there again. The pride and pomp and luxury. All the jails of England hold no more cunning a collection of thieves than court. They never leave off robbing his majesty. Even his dogs are target for pilfering. It was thought the Dutch could not even set out a fleet this year. It will have to be peace or the kingdom whole may be undone. The treaty ending the war was signed in 1667 in the town of Breda, where Charles had made his famous declaration that had allowed him to return to the English throne several years earlier. Charles was humiliated, but it did at least bring the war to an end and allow London to be rebuilt. Charles encouraged the greatest architects to come forward with radical plans for the city. Had these been realised, London today would be a completely different place. But in the end, practicalities, money, meant most of the city was rebuilt on the same plan as before. But the buildings themselves were much changed. Here, the genius of Sir Christopher Wren did have the opportunity to shine, and his designs remain some of the most famous in the London skyline. Because there was a sense of a new beginning, but a new beginning not out of total novelty, but out, out of something that was old. All sorts of exciting things happened during the Restoration and then as it unfolded the full reign of Charles II. The birth of the Royal Society, figures like Boyle, figures like Christopher Wren, clever people who were scientists, who were architects, who were literally rebuilding England. And then the rather good luck, as it happened, of the fire, which enabled London to be rebuilt and gloriously rebuilt. It must have been so exciting to look around and find yourself in this spanking new city with so many absolutely 
mind-bogglingly beautiful buildings all around you on a, a River Thames which was crammed with uh, ships, commerce, entertainment, theatres. Uh, it really was bliss to be alive, I think, in the reign of Charles II. As King Charles arranged for his city to be rebuilt, he was also building up the forces for another battle with the Dutch Republic that had so humiliated him. In secret, a new alliance was forged with Louis XIV of France. Together, they take on the Dutch. In 1670, King Charles II made a monumental decision. He signed a secret agreement with the French known as the Treaty of Dover. Charles had been humiliated by a loss to the Dutch Republic three years earlier. He was determined to gain revenge by joining forces with France to conquer the Dutch. But one of the provisos of the pact was that Charles would convert to Catholicism. Charles was playing with fire. Perhaps the thing which historians are most divided about over Charles II is what on earth he was doing in the Treaty of Dover when he told Louis XIV that he would become a Catholic if Louis would give him the men, the money and the troops to make good his claim. Now, there are plenty of people who think that he's being too clever by half, that he's simply using this as a device to get Louis to leave him and give him other things. I've always been inclined to think that Charles always yearns to become a Catholic, that for most of his reign, he can see that it'll be, it will be very dangerous, that he will cause a huge amount of political reaction. But there's a point around then and when you know, he's under such pressure from his Catholic wife, his Catholic mistress, and there's just a moment at which he thinks everywhere in Europe where monarchy is strong, Catholicism is strong. Catholics have been the people who've been my most loyal supporters. It, but for the Catholics, I would not have escaped after the Battle of Worcester. It was the Catholics who risked their lives to hide me, get me out of the country. And they, it's just possible that he went through a, a moment when he thought, I wonder if I can get away with becoming a Catholic. England was still fiercely divided by religion. A Catholic king would rip open old wounds. In March 1672, Charles made the first moves towards fulfilling part of the secret deal with King Louis XIV of France by making the Royal Declaration of Indulgence. It promised religious toleration for all, including Catholics, and seemed to be a first step towards some kind of reconciliation between England and Rome following the great break of Henry VIII's reign. You seek stained glass for the new chapel. I shall not ask how you came by such intelligence, lest you implicate the walls and doors of my chamber. I had thought it an art lost in this country. There are men in Paris who preserve the skill. Why not Rome? The king has declared indulgence on matters of religion. And parliament? I care not. Is his declaration even legal? I care not. I have an image in my mind, mother. The chapel shall not be complete without it. It is a cross, a fine cross. I must have it. It was working too long of a day that took your father ill. It is not that. Oh, yes, yeah, you must. Mother, it is not that. We shall consult physicians. I have. The outward applications having proved unsuccessful, they now prescribe inward medicines. And what course do they predict? I must have that glass, Mother. After the Declaration of Indulgence, uh, things become obviously much easier for uh, not just Catholics, but, but crypto-Catholics. We don't know precisely uh, where Sir Richard Wynne the Younger stood on this, um, but we know that he's the Chamberlain of Queen Catherine of Braganza, and we know that he's trying to get a stained glass cross for the new chapel he's building in 1673 to 4. If you look at the chapel, you would think it was a Catholic chapel, actually. In April 1672, just a month after the Royal Declaration of Indulgence, England and France declared war on the Netherlands. 
It did not go according to plan. The money promised by France to Charles was not enough to cover the military expenses. The king was forced to recall Parliament, and it contained many members who were fiercely opposed to the royal declaration. They deemed it far too generous to Catholics, and they now had the king in a bind. Parliament refused to fund the war until the declaration was withdrawn. Charles had to comply. But worse was to come for the king. The details of his secret pact with Louis XIV were leaked. The public was furious. Charles quickly realised that to defend his own position, he had to pull out of the alliance with France, end the war with the Netherlands. In early 1674, the Treaty of Westminster was signed, which brought peace between England and the Netherlands. The war had achieved precisely nothing. Fortunately, the full details of what he'd agreed to never did come out, but it clearly helps to build the climate of anxiety in the 1670s about whether there is a drift back towards Catholic monarchy. There was still a lot of political tensions and the constant question of if Charles couldn't produce a legitimate heir with Catherine of Braganza, who was going to succeed? And then the realization that his brother, James, Duke of York, was a Roman Catholic. Was, it led to a, a flaring up of intense anti-Catholic um, feeling. Uh, and part of that was driven by a, a wish to make sure that James could not become uh, the future King of England. So all in all, I think um, Charles II would have preferred a much quieter time than he was handed. also saw the death of Sir Richard Wynne the Younger. He'd been a member of Parliament for a total of 20 years, both before and after the interregnum. Without any male heirs, the Wynne estate passed to his daughter Mary, but his title of baronet would be given to his cousin, John Wynne. The strength of the Wynne family seemed to be dissipating. Charles II had returned to England, and so many across the country had had such high hopes but his reign was turning out to be a disappointment. Just like the Wynns, the Stuarts were losing power. Despite having many children with his numerous mistresses, King Charles had no legitimate heirs with his wife, Catherine of Braganza, nor would any be born in the remaining 11 years of his life. The heir apparent throughout was his younger brother, James. Many suspected that James was a Catholic. They were right. In fact, Charles II himself converted to the Catholic religion on his deathbed. He became incredibly ill in February 1685, very, very quickly, and suddenly he had a massive seizure. And then, poor man, he was handed over to the combined ignorance of the royal physicians who did not know what to do. And they took a view that the best thing they could do was stimulate him and get his whole energy pulsing through him, I suppose. So they shaved off his hair and applied white hot glass to his scalp. They put a sort of acid in his nostrils. They pumped him full of laxatives and enemas. And they gave him tonics of ground up man's skull and put poultices of pigeon droppings on his feet. And although occasionally, bizarrely, he seemed to be getting better, the general flow was towards death. And one of his mistresses, Louise de Carraway, took James, Duke of York, the king's brother, aside and said, look, please don't tell anyone I've said this, but his one wish has always been that he dies a Catholic. The evidence that Charles II converted on his deathbed is in the end the testimony of the tiny number of people who are witnesses to it. It, it is very widely accepted that it, that it was so. The man who is, is supposed to have received him into the church was someone who had helped him during his escape after Worcester in 1651 and had been, in that sense, someone he trusted for many years. And for me, at any rate, it is the logical outcome. Out of the shadows, James brings a man called Father Huddleston, who had helped Charles survive during his six weeks on the run after the Battle of Worcester. And James utters the immortal line of, Sire, I bring you now a man who once saved your life, and now he'll save your soul. And Huddleston sits with the king 
and takes him through the various processes to bring him to Catholicism, uh, including what I'd imagine was rather a long confession by Charles. And he dies the following day, having just reconnected briefly with the six weeks in his life of which he was most proud when he had shown himself to be brave and resilient. If anyone thought that the controversial issue of religious tolerance had gone away, they were mistaken. The reign of James II would bring with it another crisis in England and another war. In the next episode of The Stuarts A Bloody Reign, we see how the committed Catholic James II ascends to the throne of England, succeeding his brother. What had seemed an impossibility decades earlier was now a reality. The religious tensions across the British Isles reached fever pitch, and they would test the loyalties of the Wynne family at Gwydir Castle in their relationship with the House of Stuart. All across the country, plans were made to usurp the Catholic king, but the real danger lay very close to home. James's own daughter Mary and her husband, the Protestant William of Orange of the Dutch Republic, were the greatest threat of all. This would spell the end of the House of Stuart and the beginning of the Glorious Revolution. James II, the Catholic king of a Protestant country, was a disaster waiting to happen. The Stuarts' reign had begun with James I, then Charles I. Their belief in the divine right of kings ultimately led to their downfall. At the Restoration, Charles II became a popular, if outrageous, monarch. The kingdom remained simmering with Catholic versus Protestant sentiment. King James II was a last, desperate attempt at a Stuart monarchy. I think history is very tough on James II. He was a very brave, headstrong figure, a very good soldier, very good admiral. But unfortunately, being so pig-headedly Roman Catholic was the undoing of him. He goes on an all-out, very rapid process of Catholicization. This completely wrecks the popular base of, of his power that he'd enjoyed in his first year. He was in some ways a very competent person, but he threw it away for no particular reason, but it was absolutely extraordinary. James II just thought he was going to do his bit as a Catholic king, and it went spectacularly wrong. Charles II died on the 6th of February, 1685. He had ruled over England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland for a quarter of a century, following the restoration of the monarchy after the collapse of Oliver Cromwell's Commonwealth. Charles had converted to the Catholic faith on his deathbed and he would be succeeded by his younger brother, King James II, a man who had been Catholic for nearly two decades. In a country that was now officially Protestant, this was a grave concern. James II's reign would not last long. In this series, we've examined the reign of the four Stuart monarchs through the lives of the Wynne family, who lived here at Gwydir Castle in North Wales. The Wynnes owned hundreds of acres of land surrounding the castle, and they prospered enormously during the Stuart era. It all began with John Wynne, who inherited the Wynne estate in 1580 during the reign of the earliest Stuart monarch, King James I. John would be knighted, and the family would be honored with the title of baronet. During King Charles I's reign, Gwydir was overseen by John Wynne's son, Sir Owen and Sir Richard. It was at this point that the connection between the Wynne family and the ruling Stuart dynasty was strongest of all, as Sir Richard Wynne was a close personal friend of King Charles I. But then, civil war broke out, and the king was beheaded. Sir Richard Wynne never recovered and died Charles. just a few months after he witnessed his friend and king being publicly executed. Sir Owen Wynne had to care for the estate with his wife, Lady Grace, during the challenging period of Oliver Cromwell's rule. 
With the restoration of the monarchy and the return of King Charles II, the winds would prosper once again. This time, with Sir Owen's son, Sir Richard Wynne the Younger, back in the restored royal court. However, Sir Richard Wynne the Younger had no male heirs, meaning the estate passed to his daughter, Mary, known to everyone as Mally. Along with her grandmother, Lady Grace, it was her job to maintain the Wynne estate in the new era of the Restoration. Lady Sarah dies of the plague in 1671, she's very young, and then in 1674, at the age of 39, Sir Richard dies as well, so it's too young. And that means that they only have one child, that's the lovely Lady Mary, and at the age of 17, she is suddenly the heiress of a vast estate. Um, and the person who's, uh, who becomes the sort of grand choreographer of all of this is her grandmother, Lady Grace Wynne, who um, survives um, as the matriarch, this powerful figure of the past. And she brokers marriage deal after marriage deal until she finds the one that is acceptable. And the one that's acceptable turns out to be the young Lord Willoughby Deresby, uh, Robert Barty. Mally married Robert Bertie in 1678, later the Duke of Ancaster, a member of Parliament. The baronetcy that the Wynne family had gained during the reign of King James I could not be transferred to the female line, and so that was given to a junior branch of the Wynne family, and the Berties acquired the Gwydir estate. From that moment, the direct connection of the Wynnes to the land and the landscape and the people of, of North Wales stops because it becomes a secondary estate. It becomes an additional part of the Willoughby Deresby Empire, which was in itself quite huge. They were a Lincolnshire family based at Grimsthorpe Castle. Um, Lord Willoughby Deresby goes on to become um, the Earl and then the Duke of Ancaster and Castevan, so he becomes very important. The Wynne family, once so powerful, was now losing influence and status, and so were the Stuarts. For most of his life, King James II had never expected to become king. He'd been born in St. James's Palace in London in 1633, the second son of King Charles I and his wife, Henrietta Maria. James held the title of the Duke of York from birth. During the English Civil War, he'd been confined by Parliament to his birthplace, St. James's Palace, while his father fought a losing battle with the Royalist forces. At the age of 15, James managed to sneak away from his confines, disguised as a woman, and made it all the way to The Hague in the Netherlands. Continental Europe would be where James would spend much of his life. When his father was executed in 1649, when James was only 16, his elder brother was proclaimed king by the royalists and the parliaments of Scotland and Ireland. Charles was even crowned in Scotland in 1651, but the Stuart family was unable to reclaim England and eventually Oliver Cromwell prevailed, becoming the undisputed ruler of a new Commonwealth. Charles and his brother James sought exile in France, their mother's homeland, and it was during this time abroad that James was exposed to the beliefs and the ceremonies of the Catholic religion. As time went by, he was drawn to that faith with greater and greater conviction. James even served in the French army, but France chose to ally itself with Oliver Cromwell. The Stuart family made an alliance with Spain as a result, and James switched over to the Spanish forces and battled his previous French colleagues. James learned to be a soldier and he'd fought first for the French and then for the Spanish. He'd fought for the French until he was driven out of the French army by the treaty by which Cromwell um, allied with France against Spain. But he just flipped over and went and fought for the, uh, for the Spanish side and in fact, uh, in the last of the great battles of the New Model Army, back in the dunes up in France and Belgium, the English armies of Cromwell, one of the people fighting against them was James. He was on the battlefield.
Jones was considered a brave fighter and was on the brink of accepting the rank of Admiral in the Spanish Navy when the collapse of Cromwell's protectorate in England rapidly changed those Stuart prospects. James declined the Spanish offer. Within months, his brother would reclaim the English throne. James returned to London and was soon appointed Lord High Admiral of the Navy. He became one of his brother's closest advisers and was widely praised for his tireless efforts to extinguish the Great Fire of London. But in private, his religious allegiances were shifting. His wife, Anne Hyde, had converted to the Catholic religion almost as soon as the couple had returned to London. By the late 1660s, James had converted as well. We now know that James was formally received in the Catholic Church in 1668. He continues to attend Protestant services for a few years, but the news about his, his going you know, privately to Catholic Mass, Catholic confessors and so on, was, was leaking out. And by 1676, James comes out. So then you have a crisis that the heir to the throne is going to be a Catholic. Therefore, there is a huge political campaign to prevent it. Well, I think history is very tough on James II. We tend to forget all about him except the disaster of his three years as a king. He was a very brave, headstrong figure. He was a very good soldier, very good admiral, and had fought bravely, and he, he had a lot of qualities. But unfortunately, being so pig-headedly Roman Catholic was the undoing of him. Sixteen seventy-three was a critical year in the life of the future King James II. His first wife, Anne Hyde, who converted to the Catholic faith long before him, died in sixteen seventy-one, and James was about to marry his second wife, Mary of Medina. Sixteen seventy-three was also the year of the Test Act. This was a penal law voted in by Parliament, and it required all civil and military officials to take an oath that declared their allegiance to the Anglican Church. James was in an impossible position. He couldn't betray his principles and make such an oath. He refused, resigned as Lord High Admiral. Well, there had been rumours abounding that he converted to the Catholic faith and he was now married to a Catholic bride from Italy. Those rumours now seemed confirmed by James' refusal to make that oath required by the Test Act. The difficulty with James II was everyone knew he was Catholic. Uh, it was not something he could hide, and not something he wanted to hide either. Um, I mean, obviously, when push came to, to shove at the Test Act, he had to just resign his commission as Admiral. And that meant he was okay, because he didn't have to do any signing, he didn't have to do any oathing. The fact that James's elder brother, King Charles II, had no legitimate heirs with his wife, Catherine of Braganza, that meant James was next in line for the throne. He became the focus of numerous conspiracy theories. Many suspected there were plots to assassinate Charles, replace him with James. Anti-Catholic sentiment rose again across the country. Fairly soon after the test acts and the sheer scale of the number of people who resigned, which took people by surprise, they had no idea they would have so many people who were secret Catholics. And the great anxiety of what will happen if a Catholic does become king, you begin to get people who started to claim that there was a conspiracy at the top of government to assassinate Charles to hasten James's accession to the throne. That is called the Popish Plot. And the claim that there were, that there were a large number of people who were conspiring to assassinate the king. And that if James didn't know about it, he was turning a blind eye to it. And in any case, he was the beneficiary of what they were doing. And the way to prevent the assassination of the king and the succession of a Catholic ruler was to pass an act that would mean that the Catholics couldn't, couldn't benefit from the assassination. I mean, if there was a law which prevented a Catholic successor, there's no point in killing the existing king, particularly one who had been fairly lenient, you know, in his attitude to the Catholic population. To soothe the worried public, King Charles II arranged for James's daughter Mary to marry the Protestant William of Orange. 
James reluctantly consented to the match. The marrying of, of William of Orange, who was of royal British blood and therefore had a potential claim to James's elder daughter, gave a, a potential focus now for those who were just not prepared to tolerate a Catholic king. This was not enough, however, to relieve the growing hysteria in the country and in Parliament. In 1679, the Exclusion Bill was introduced into the House of Commons. If passed, it would have prevented James from inheriting the throne because he was Catholic. The Exclusion Bill was also having an impact at Gwydir Castle. Mally Wynne had married Robert Bertie, Lord Willoughby Deresby, the previous year. He had tried unsuccessfully for election into Parliament. Mally Wynne and her grandmother, Lady Grace, eagerly await correspondence from him as unrest spreads across the country at the thought of King Charles II's brother, James, becoming the first Catholic monarch. My lady, my lady. Thank you, Tal. Poor Tal. Are there no others that could deliver your letters, Grandmama? The years on Tal have not rendered him past use. No, I cannot conceive of Gwydir without him. But surely there are others who can share his burden. Master Williams has a son. A boy. He is 19. How fares your husband? Is Robert recovered from his disappointment? He resolves to stand again in the next election, though when that will be. The exclusionists are much in the ascendancy. Even if the bill passes through the Commons, it will fail in the laws. Oh, I pray it is so. The Duke of York will be king, child. Fool does he be. Grandmama. Oh, not in my time, I pray. Does the Duke not abide by his conscience, his principles? Principles are an o'er-admired thing. I wonder, though, at the exclusionist mind, can the law alter what God has settled? If Parliament can choose itself a king, why not a tenant his lord? It pulls at society's very order, I fear. I suppose Master Williams can learn the duties of a gatekeeper. They grow so fast, the young. <laughs> Let us see if we can o'erpace Tal and tell him of his new apprentice. <laughs> the bill bitterly divided the commons. Indeed, parts of the modern British parliamentary system can be said to date from this dispute. Those who backed the exclusion bill became known as the Whigs. Those against became known as the Tories. The bill was finally defeated in 1681 when it was rejected by the House of Lords. Clearly the failure of exclusion and the revenge which is taken by uh, the regime in dismissing so many with their prominent supporters of exclusion from their, their positions will produce, as it always has in history, you know, some people who overreact and think the, the only solution is to assassinate Charles and James. There's a lot of talk, there's not at all clear how much action there is to plan to intercept him as he returns to London from the races in Newmarket. But in fact, they return early, and so the plot hadn't matured. But when you have plots, there are always people going to betray them because you can't make a plot work without a lot of people knowing. And if a lot of people know, it's increasingly likely somebody will know who will betray it. And that's what happens. The botched assassination attempt on the Stuart brothers in 1683 provoked a wave of sympathy for James. Several Whig opponents were implicated, and James's position was strengthened further as a result of their fall. The Catholic Duke of York would indeed be king. <laughs> king 
King James II was crowned on April the 23rd, 1685, but almost immediately he faced a rebellion from his own nephew, the Duke of Monmouth. Monmouth was the eldest illegitimate son of King Charles II. He proclaimed himself the true king in Lyme Regis in Dorset, and his Monmouth rebellion attempted to overthrow King James II. Here at Gwydir, the situation was followed especially closely because Mally's husband, Robert Bertie, was a captain and was now fighting on behalf of King James in the attempt to swiftly crush the rebellion. It gives me great joy, dear husband, to hear of your efforts in London and the Commons on behalf of our new king. There is great rejoicing here at Grimsthorpe as well. This Sunday gone, the parson even read from the pulpit his majesty's words, which I thought very fine and noted well. I shall make it my endeavour to preserve this government, both in church and state, as it is by law established, as I shall never depart from the rights and prerogative of the crown, so I shall never invade any man's property. The parson gave it much import, the word of a king being more secure by far than any mutable law. Lord Willoughby Darrisby is holding office under James II, but also, interestingly, he's captain of a troop of horse under King James, fighting uh, at the Battle of Sedgemoor in 1685, so against the Duke of Monmouth in the Monmouth Rebellion. That's very interesting. The Monmouth Rebellion was quickly dealt with, as was another rebellion in Scotland that occurred at the same time, known as Argyll's Rising, led by the Earl of Argyll. These two rebellions had been coordinated together, but neither of them were able to drum up enough volunteers in the end. Both the Duke of Monmouth and the Earl of Argyll were captured and executed. The rebellions were put down with ease, but they deepened James's insecurities. He strengthened his army and put loyal men in charge of the regiments. This might have eased his worries, but the actions caused alarm in Parliament. A standing army of such size was not a tradition and many of the chosen commanders were Catholics. This placed Mally's husband, Lord Willoughby's position as captain, under threat. Are you in there, boy? Forgive me, my lady. Thought it was young Williams. I can have these chambers readied. No, no. Well, perhaps just the fire. Tal? Yes, my lady. Will you not sit a moment? Well, I know you did so with my grandmother from time to time. Perhaps in her memory? And how is Master Williams proving? Uh, tardy. <laughs> Often in need of a bath. <laughs> I can see why you and my grandmama got on so. You were a soldier, were you not? For the martyred king. We have always been loyal servants to the crown, this family. My husband's likewise. He's been turned out of his employment as captain. And the king is displeased with the militia. He desires a standing army with officers he can trust. Though Robert led a troop of horse against Monmouth in 85, he is not of the popish faith, nor are his brothers. The king has cleared the army of our whole family. I am sorry, my lady. We were only ever loyal. But our hope for advance now seems quite remote. The gunpowder plot of 1605 has seemed like a last desperate attempt to return a Catholic monarch to the throne. But now, with King James II, the seemingly impossible had happened. The new king's royal court was soon dominated by Catholics. A representative from Rome was welcomed for the first time since the days of Mary I, over a century before. In May 1686, James sought a ruling from the courts to show he had the power to dispense with acts of parliament. He fired judges who disagreed with him. The following year, he made a new declaration of indulgence, announcing religious toleration, including for the English Catholic minority, and ordered it be read from every pulpit in the land. The man thought to be the instigator of the Declaration of Indulgence was William Penn, 
the founder of Pennsylvania and member of a new religious movement that had arisen during Stuart rule, Quakerism. Penn went on a tour of the country to promote James's declaration of indulgence, but it was fiercely resisted by the Anglican clergy. James overplays his hand. He wants to give Catholics a lot of power so that they can demonstrate they can use it responsibly, so that they can show they can be Catholics who will live in peace with their Protestant neighbours. So he goes on an all-out, uh, very rapid process of Catholicization of local government of the civil service. He's determined to reverse the penal laws. He's got to find people who will do his bidding who are Protestant. And so the Anglican establishment are pushed aside and lots of Quakers and Presbyterians and others are pressed into service to be nominated to Parliament. And he changes the conditions of elections in towns so that the town councils will elect MPs and not the general electorate. He narrows the franchise. And then, of course, he himself nominates the people who will be the town councillors. It is an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. And he calls in every single existing MP one by one and asks them if they will support the repeal of the penal laws and the test acts. And they all say no. So he has to go to these even more desperate lengths. And uh, this, this um, completely wrecks the popular base of, of his power that he'd enjoyed in his first year. The Archbishop of Canterbury, along with six other bishops, defied the King's orders. The seven bishops, as they were known, were soon arrested, taken to the Tower of London. But their acts of resistance galvanised the public in an unexpected manner. The bishops were eventually acquitted at their trial and this meant jubilant scenes up and down the nation, embarrassing the king. With each passing month of his reign, James seemed to mimic and exceed the example of his executed father more and more. His attempts to rule as an absolute monarch were being fiercely resisted. His reign, that had started with enthusiasm, general goodwill, was coming to a crashing end. I think he believed it was his duty as a Catholic prince to push forward the Catholic agenda in this country. He strayed into parts of life that were very threatening to the establishment. Um, he got involved in the election of, of fellows at Magdalen College, Oxford, and it became a cause celeb with uh, people having to, very important, influential people being put into prison because they disagreed with him. And at the end of the day, I think he thought his powers as a monarch were greater than they were. He hadn't taken on board the lessons of the civil wars, the fact that the Stuarts weren't able to just behave as they wished. On the 10th of June, 1688, King James and his wife, Mary of Medina, had a son. According to the rules of primogeniture, this child was due to inherit the throne but James already had two daughters from his first marriage, Mary and Anne, and they'd been raised Protestant according to the wishes of King Charles II. The people just about tolerated James's pro-Catholic rule because they knew his only possible successors were his Protestant daughters. But now, with the baby, there was a real threat of a permanent Catholic dynasty. And to many in the church and across the country, this was simply unacceptable. And there's another pretty intriguing twist to this story. The child born to King James II and Mary of Medina was rumored to be an imposter. The story went that the royal baby was still born and another child was smuggled in to replace him and ensure a Catholic succession. When James II's second wife, Mary of Modena, had a son, even that wasn't enough. I mean, clearly that boy should have been king in the, in the, the law of succession. But the Protestant establishment managed to say that the baby had been smuggled in in a bedpan. It wasn't really uh, the rightful heir to the throne. And there was a ready-made heir in William and Mary and their line. King James II knew he had a problem on his hands. He published testimonies of numerous witnesses who'd been present at the birth of his son. He also made plans to pack the next parliament with his supporters and cement his grip on power. 
but their news reached him of a fresh challenge to his authority. William of Orange, the husband of James's Protestant daughter Mary, was coming to England with an invasionary force. What became known as the Glorious Revolution had begun. They persuaded William and Mary that they were being cut out of their lawful rights by this tended child, and they should come to England to insist on their rights to a full public inquiry into the legitimacy of the new Prince of Wales. Um, and William is willing to do that because William is fighting an all-out war against Louis XIV and he desperately wants English resources, he wants English troops and above all English money. Now the contender was William, who saw England as a very, very useful ally, particularly its wealth and its navy, in his perpetual battle against Louis XIV's France. So that's why he was prepared to do it. It wasn't out of any great pride or whatever, it was purely practical. He wanted to have the English on side against France in the great struggle uh, against the Catholic King. William of Orange certainly had pedigree. He'd been involved in several battles with the Catholic King of France and he was seen across Europe as a staunch defender of the Protestant faith. His armada of 463 ships carried 15,000 fighting men across the Channel. William landed his forces at Torbay on the 5th of November, 1688. 83 years after Guy Fawkes' attempt to end the rule of Stuart Kings had failed, another attempt on another king, James, was about to begin. And this time, it wasn't going to fail. The Glorious Revolution is sometimes known as the Bloodless Revolution. While that's not literally the case, it certainly was very low on casualties. When William of Orange's forces arrived on the English coast, the army of King James II that they were up against was twice the size. But William knew he had support among the English, and his strategy was perfect. He had gathered enough finances during his preparations for the war to pay his soldiers for three months in advance, meaning they were happy to delay any battle. William's patience paid off, as James's troops soon started to defect an anti-Catholic riot spread across the land. The brief reign of James II was collapsing, and he knew it. Lord Willoughby Deresby advised his wife Mally to seek refuge in the relative safety of Gwydir Castle, as support for William of Orange was spreading. No running, Elizabeth! What did I say? Uh, how long will my lady and the children be in residence? As long as my husband deems it necessary for our safety. A general insurrection, is it? How do you perceive the local sentiment? The king jailed our Lord Bishop. Some might mark that in his favour, others less. But do you detect any general inclination? He ought not to have done it, my lady. My husband is for the Duke of Orange. He marches on York with his brothers, and his uncle stays at court so the family can claim loyalty should the enterprise go awry. But what then of Robert? Any letters come, I shall have them brought at once. Day or night. James's real problem lies in the fact that he's relying on certain loyalties that are no longer intact. His own children, the two daughters, Mary and Anne, have been persuaded to put their Protestantism above their duties as daughters. And this, of course, is a devastating blow to James when he finds this out. And also, some of his finest generals have made it clear that they will fight against the king rather than for him, um, including John Churchill, who becomes the first Duke of Marlborough who had been really the instrument who had defeated Monmouth at the Battle of Sedgemoor three years earlier. Maybe it was because he was a Protestant and he couldn't bear to help a Catholic. But James was correct to say that he had taken him from an obscure page boy 
given him a commission and helped him on his way. And now this young, brilliant commander was fighting against him. When William arrives, James's commanders are career mercenaries. They're not Catholics. They do what mercenaries always do. They make a calculation on whether they think they're going to win. And James is having some sort of nervous breakdown. Um, he has incessant nosebleeds, which are clearly hypertension. He's clearly behaving irrationally. And I think the professional soldiers, like John Churchill, or the future Duke of Marlborough, they look at their commander-in-chief and they think, this is not a guy I want to serve with. To have your daughters side against you in a, in a matter really of life and death and of your dynasty's future, and to have those who you've made from nothing into people of great substance, it must have been devastating on a personal level. But there was always the thought during his remaining years that, well, look what happened to Charles II. He had come back against the odds. So we know it never happened. But I, there were a lot of people in England who were playing a double game, um, communicating with James in secret, just in case he did come back, because they didn't want to end up being um, beheaded. They've taken York. The northern nobles are declaring for William. The king marches west to meet the prince with 40,000 men. Though Robert says that number is continually diminished. Whole armies are abandoning the king's cause. Day by day, Prince William's army grows. All seems to be happening with great speed, my lady. Well, Robert is very hopeful. Unwilling to make the compromises that might have saved his reign, James readied himself to flee the country. He ordered his unreliable army to disband. His wife and baby son left for France in early December. And when it came his turn to follow, James petulantly dumped the Great Seal in the Thames. Without it, no lawful parliament could be called. James fled to France to join his family, and William let him go. It is done. The king has fled to France, the queen and the prince of Wales too, with scarce a battle or bloodshed. Will we be making arrangements for your return to Grimsthorpe, my lady? We shall. <laughs> All so well. These knees aren't much after chasing the young ones. <laughs> they have been most contented here, as have I. King James' escape to France was actually a total farce. The yacht that was meant to take him across the channel was boarded by English fishermen. They'd no idea who he was. They thought he was a Jesuit spy. He was kept prisoner for a week before the uh, misunderstanding was rectified, and he was even returned to London. To William's intense rage, he's brought back by some fishermen in Faversham, so he has to be allowed to escape a second time. And this time, you know, the roads are kept clear and, and the orders are under no, no circumstances find him. So he gets into France and Louis XIV takes him in rather startled at this unexpected defeat he's experienced and sets him up with his own court at Saint-Germain near Paris. Within a matter of weeks, Parliament declared that James had abdicated the throne and left it vacant. William and Mary were declared joint monarchs. Just as the promise of a stable succession had been so important to the elevation of James VI to the throne as James I in 1603, so it was the peace and security embodied by William and Mary that ultimately secured that crown for them. I always view 1688 and James II's exile as the defining moment of the change that started with the outbreak of civil war in 1642, where really the, the, the status of the crown is subjugated to that of parliament. And it's James, because of his three years of intensely unintelligent, prejudiced rule, he brings it to a head, finally, 
so that uh, the, the, the British Parliament gets the upper hand from then on. James did not give up. He was planning an attempt to reclaim the throne, just as his elder brother Charles had done. With the help of the French, he landed in Ireland and raised an army to seize back the throne. But he was defeated by William at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690. James fled, never to return to England. I don't think James II was a natural quitter. It was because of the overwhelming evidence that it was over. He just misjudged the central tenet of the Protestant establishment in England, particularly when they looked overseas to France and saw what Louis XIV was doing to the Protestants, treating them with savagery, um, people being broken on the wheel, literally broken on a wagon wheel, or being executed in other ways, or being branded uh, as being Protestants. And it was so close geographically, and the, the, the thought that it might come across the Channel to England meant that there was absolutely no way that what looked suspiciously like Catholic absolutism could be tolerated by James's people. James died in exile in 1701, convinced he'd lost his throne because God had punished him for his adultery. His remains were destroyed during the French Revolution, and so too were his memoirs, meaning that we don't have an awful lot of his perspective, and we've got rather a lot of the opinions of his enemies. James's descendants made attempts to get that throne back. His son, the reported imposter James Francis Edward, became known as the Old Pretender. He started a rebellion in 1715, the Jacobite Rising, and tried to restore the exile Stuart dynasty. He failed. There was another attempt in 1719 with Spanish support, but it was just as ineffective. Then in 1745, King James II's grandson, Bonnie Prince Charlie, made one final shot at the crown, but the country had moved on. King James II was the last Stuart King. The winds span the whole rise and fall of the Stuarts. Sir John Wynne is knighted in 1606, three years after James I came to the throne, one of the very first baronets. Charles I served loyally by Sir Richard Wynne, second baronet. The fourth baronet, Richard Wynne the Younger, was Chamberlain to the Queen of Charles II. The brief reign of James II, followed by the glorious revolution in 1688. And then, in 1689, Lady Mary Wynne, the last of the Wynnes, dies. Gwydir Castle's glory has also come to an end. four Stuart men who ruled England, Wales, Ireland and Scotland each wrestled with similar problems. The scope, the nature of government was contested at this time as it never was before. It made their era divisive, often bloody. But the reigns of the Stuart kings saw the beginnings of the modern British state, the unification of England and Scotland, the last death rattles of absolute monarchy and the rise of Parliament as the dominant power in the land.